Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. Second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. <laughs> it might be just a little more time today. Um, I'm going to be showing how to use, how to build 3D countdown clocks in motion. And it doesn't take very long. <laughs> so if you don't have questions, it'll be really short. Anyway, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Mitchell, what do we have? Thank you. Uh, first question coming in from Brian Shandon, Sydney, Australia. For a streaming setup, should lighting color be set to 3200K or 5600K? Go ahead, Chris. My preference is daylight, uh, 5600. And um, I don't know why, because technically it, it shouldn't matter. It, it absolutely shouldn't matter. Uh, you pick a light color, you adjust your color on the camera, you white balance and it should be fine um but for some reason i just i like i like daylight better and i think i think it has to do with the fact that quite often although not for me i'm realizing quite often we're dealing with people that have daylight spill coming from a, a, a home setup and then everything you know blends and mixes better but um I, my preference is, is daylight go ahead, tom well, to reiterate a little bit what Chris said, uh, it, de it depends. In my case, I'm using 3200 because the window behind me, I've actually blocked out the sun completely, so I don't have any daylight coming into this room. And other fill lights and so forth are 3200 to start out with. Now go ahead, Dak Courtney. Yeah, most uh, cameras can color balance for either 3200 or 5600 or anything in between. Uh, it depends, like they said, with your ambient lighting in the room. If it's a nighttime scene, you can do it at 3200. One thing to take into consideration is if you have any monitors in the shot. If you've got a TV set or a monitor behind you with an image on it, uh, you want to probably go for daylight because most monitors are balanced at 9600 or 6000 to 9600 up in the high end. So in order to get uh, proper color rendition on the monitor, you're going to have to start there, and that's the hardest thing to change is the color balance on that monitor. And when you move them to tungsten balance, they get very tweaky as to their uh, angle of view. So um, they, they'll shift radically as you move off the sweet spot uh, if you adjust them for, you know, 3200. So take that into consideration when you're choosing. Uh, and just get everything to to be kind of in the same neighborhood. Good, Mitchell. I agree with the distinguished gentleman before me. Um, I start with 5600 because there may be a window or may not be a window, but it's just a starting point. And uh, once you've balanced for that, uh, you don't have to worry about the TV screens and the window and the spill and things like that. You go ahead, Tony. I am using 5600, but I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm going to be transparent. <laughs> <laughs> I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. It's working. Um, Whatever you're doing, it's working. Well, if it's 5,600, uh, I know there are other adjustments that need to be made, but maybe one day in after hours, Mickey and the crew can help me out. That looks great. That looks great. What do you, uh, Alex, what do you do? I, I use 5,600. So, so I am um, now the, the tr traditionally, 3200 was considered the right thing to use. And that has a lot to do with the CRI. So the CRI of tungsten was 100 uh, or, or usually very close. And the CRI of Kinoflows and LEDs and everything else were in the low 90s, high 80s. Uh, the CRI has gotten a lot better in LEDs than I think they're in the you know, in high 90s now. So they're much closer to tungsten. So the accuracy of the color, um, the, the color curve was better at 3200 for a long time. Um, older cameras tended to work better at 3200 too. So there was a reason to use 3200 in the past. Um, but a lot of that's gotten better. CRI, by the way, is color rendering index. Thank you. Was, yes. Oh, just, sorry. Just on the yeah. off chance that Fenwick may not know what CRA. I'm sorry. Using. Yeah. So if you, but a color rendering index and it's just how accurate the light is compared to the sun, you know, pretty much. And so, so the, um, uh, so the, uh, Anyway, so the, or, or not the sun, but total wavelengths so of what we should be able to see in, in that curve. And Guy probably knows more about it than I do because um, he's had to deal with it a lot. Um, anyway, so, uh, but, but I, the, so 3200 was, was, uh, and uh, again, 
we did a lot of 3200 because the uh, HMIs that we had to rent were really expensive, you know, if we wanted to do 5600. So 5600 was a really expensive thing to do. It wasn't as accurate. Uh, well, the HMIs were pretty accurate, but I mean, the, when we did it with cheaper bulbs and everything else, it was very difficult. And so, but nowadays, the biggest problem you have is outdoor light. I mean, typically in, you know, some kind of incidental light. Um, and so, and we, we have so much control. I mean, every once in a while you feel like an old person then you just go, you don't understand. You don't understand how hard this was before. <laughs> you know, when you look at lights now, you know, the, the, whether it's Aperture or Nan Light or, or many of these other ones, and they're so inexpensive and they're so powerful and they're so flexible. Like, you know, you just, um, you know, I, I definitely understand how pe people, when I was a kid would say, you know, I had to do, I had to walk uphill in the snow backwards every day for 10 miles. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. What there was saying? a look, there was a look that you would see, um, and even in very high-end productions where they were trying to expose for the window, but they had they were underpowered for the the lights they had inside a room, and you would have this really awful, like, just put more lights on the guy. And I was thinking about or more ND. <laughs> yeah, well, usually it was light. And so there's um there's a very famous shot of, I believe it it was an episode of Columbo from the 70s. And I think that Steven Spielberg actually directed this one episode. And there's a shot where they follow a car down a road from a high vantage point, And then the camera pulls back to reveal that you're in an office building and it is horribly lit. Yeah. And this is a high end television and it is horribly lit, but it, it, hard. there was definitely a look. Yes, it was uphill both ways in the snow. <laughs> the worst one is when you had to ND one of those windows that had all the little blocks of, you know, that had like little one one foot squares and every like 16 of them. And it, that was like a day of someone's life was to get that to ND properly. Go ahead, uh, Courtney. Yes, I remember on Roar, we had a scene where Tippi Hedren was in a room and she opens the shutters on the window and there's no glass in this window. And there's an elephant out in the lake right outside the window. And we have to see that and it has to be properly exposed. It's the middle of the day. Uh, you can't gel the window to to compensate for that. You're shooting on film with a fairly slow ASA, you know. Yeah. And they had to put a nine light right above her <laughs> to get enough light, on her, and her hair caught on fire. Oh no! <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, seriously, I think we have to do a yeah, second started, hour about roars. Smoke and it's like, oh god. god. <laughs> Go ahead, Mitchell. Anyway, wait, uh, I had one other thing something else. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, the, the, real, the real thing I wanted <laughs> oh, to say Oh, the real is, thing. That was a pretty good <laughs> side Be careful thing. if you're shooting it at, uh, if you don't have a lot of light in the room and you're shooting uh, without ambient light in the room, uh, set it to 5600 because we're all sitting in front of um, video screens. And right. a lot of times you'll see when the video screen comes on, suddenly everyone, if they're set to 3200, they'll suddenly turn blue and look like a ghost. Uh, and so that's a bad look. And if you're at 5,600, it'll just give you a little more fill light. You know? The funny thing is in some, in some compute movies with computers, they specifically go to a warmer, uh, light like, thir or like 3,200 so that, so that it, you see that, that impact of, I turned on the computer and I see that not, not just brighter, but it's blue and it has, but that definitely is a creative decision. Yeah. Go ahead, Mitchell. We were just talking about HDMIs and the bright light that they give out. Uh, my eye doctor tells me that being exposed to HDMI and CRT uh, TV monitors were what hastened my uh, cataract surgery. Yeah, um, everything was surprised. slightly yellow because of it. I have a tendency to, um, I have my, my phone is set to go to as warm as it'll go and down somewhat all the time. Unless I tell it I want to do something different with it. It's just it's because I feel like otherwise it's drilling a hole into my head. Next question. Often guest Andy Cartoluccio from San Francisco, California, asked, uh, in light of upcoming festivities in the U.S., can we review the best ways to photograph fireworks? How about video? I go ahead, Tom. Well, number one and most important is a tripod. Then you go to your cable release or remote, and then you can get into your settings. Okay, your settings would be ISO 100, 200, somewhere around there. Uh, because these are light sources. And then F11 uh, is a good starting place. You adjust to taste and you end up with something perhaps like this. <laughs> nice. Uh, go ahead, uh, John. A couple of things. I, I don't know how to make it look good, Andy, but I can tell you two things. Uh, I was the dealer for Pandemonium and they had a fireworks um, two and a half D renderer and it was amazing. I sold that to a lot of guys. 
for fireworks back in the day, number one. Number two, uh, the best fireworks show I ever saw was the drone flying down the strip on New Year's Eve in the middle of the fireworks. It was spectacular. Yeah, no, absolutely. The second best one was San Diego when all of the fireworks went off at the same time. <laughs> Go ahead, Mitchell. Um, yeah, the it's counterintuitive, but you want to open it up, uh, open a camera uh, iris up so to get the uh, to get the proper exposure, not the other way around. So uh, once you've done that, and the other thing is, make sure autofocus is off. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because I've always I've always done it with a, a closed app, a closer aperture because it's really hard to get everything in focus. Otherwise, I mean, it's just it's such a wide range. But, uh, you know, we haven't, I, I've always shot somewhere in the 10, you know, like the 11 to higher range if I can. Uh, grain is a big deal. So, I mean, yeah, that definitely lower ISO. Go ahead, Sky. I, I don't want to say the iPhone, but that's what I've been using for the last several years. And since the 11, actually the 11, 12, and 13 all have take, taken nice videos. So, it's, it's capturing the experience, not maybe the, the beauty shot that Tom is getting, but. They have a firework algorithm. They do. They actually have a fire. <laughs> they actually do it in the phone. Um, uh, uh, next question. Next question again from Brian Shand again in Sydney, Australia. As someone who makes training videos, I wanted to improve my front of camera presentation skills. Should I consider a presentation and or voice coach? Go ahead, Sky. I think what you're asking for is somebody to help come alongside you and and guide you and reflect back what is your presentation doing? So that's the question you're going to ask is, are your presentations being received well by your audience? In that case, maybe you don't need more camera skill. Maybe you want to be a performer, which is kind of a different skill set. So maybe find a small theater company to help you and and join, uh, you know, be doing little bit parts. But otherwise, again, why is your what, why are you doing what you're doing? And if your audience is not receiving the information, it may not be because of your, your vocal skills or your presentation skills. So again, just define the difference of uh, what is it that you're trying to accomplish and who's, who's supposed to be rece receiving the best uh, from that. Good, Mitchell. Yeah, Sky is exactly right because uh, the style now too um, in doing presentation uh, is to be more natural as opposed to be... Uh, uh, Wink Martindale, you know, with a smile. Of, hey, everybody, welcome to our party. Well, I really want to do ones like that. This I is wanted... what this is what forty years of doing it in front of the camera does to you. So, uh, be more natural and, like Sky said, accept the input from folks around you. I want to do ones like in a, in like the like the fifties videos where the, there's a certain announcer to it, and I, I I think it was actually from the early eighties. There's a soldering video on YouTube that I just think is great, but it's but it's uh, that I send everybody. I'm trying to learn how to solder. I'm like, just watch this first, and and but it has that very like announcery uh, presentation to it, and I, I was like, I wonder how many storyboards they did for the soldering tutorial. Go ahead, Chris. Um, many years ago, I was giving a presentation at. Um, at an event and uh, Tim Jennison of, of uh, New Tech came to our booth to watch the presentation that I was doing. And at the end of it, he, he looked at me and he said, nice demo, get a voice coach. Because <laughs> um, um, I, was, I was like a day and a half into this thing and I was completely hoarse and everything. Um, I would say, uh, Brian, that on camera, if you have the, if you have the funds and you have the time, you should certainly talk to somebody. Um, frankly, anybody here would would probably gladly, you know, get on a Zoom call with you and uh, might have some input. Um, uh, I'm not advocating somebody to get paid, but, you know, hey, money does change hands. Um, but I think that looking at something from the outside and objectively and being... Um, uh, accepting of some criticism is an extremely powerful uh, skill to have. Uh, so much of the time these days, people don't want criticism. There are people there are, and, and sometimes it has to come from a trusted thing. I know that like Sky and I quite often we will criticize each other and it comes from a good place. And we understand that we're just trying to, you know, elevate each other. But if you have the time, I would, I would highly recommend it. Go ahead, Tony. And I had to come after Chris Fenwick because I'm going to go the other way. <laughs> I, I want to say that um, 
Brian, you have, a, I think, a fantastic voice. And I would steal from Alex Lindsay from the standpoint of going the best you can and adding that extra 20%. I think that you are on the path to, to being what you want to do. Just continue to do what you're doing and be authentic. And add that 20%, I think you'll be okay. And I, I, to be honest, I, I didn't make that up either. It was uh, me asking, I asked when Kevin Rose was an intern at tech TV, I asked him, so what's the, what's the trick? I walked it as the first time I was on tech TV and, and he said, just be yourself plus 25%. <laughs> and that was, and I, and it, it is the best advice I've gotten so far. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, if you're doing presentation videos and you're not the expert on the subject of the thing you're making the video for, uh, use a teleprompter. Uh, rehearse the script several times with that teleprompter and a professional teleprompter operator uh, who will scroll uh, <clears throat> so that you're not trying to fish around for the next subject or uh, you know the next topic or you don't stray from the subject and get off off topic. Uh, the teleprompter and a script uh, will keep you on topic even if you only put bullet points up. I suggest actually scripting it and having it written out and follow the script. Uh, you see a lot of uh, these YouTube YouTubers who have uh, who do long presentations and reviews like uh, Technology Connections, that kid that does those. They're long half hour presentations directly to camera and they're all written out and run off a teleprompter in advance. And uh, you can look a lot more intelligent if it looks like you know the subject uh, if you're, you're able to look into the camera and recite long passages without making a lot of mistakes. But you have to be able to read. If you're dyslexic, not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, it's also harder. 2022 and you can do a bunch of jump cuts. Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, a lot of, you can do a lot of edits, um, make, make it a lot easier to do that. And that's what a lot of B-roll is good for as well, is just papering over or just jumping. It doesn't seem to matter anymore. Um, the, uh, the one thing I would say is that, uh, uh, again, practice is is a big piece of this puzzle and we'd love to have you join a, join our panel it's a great way to practice uh, of dancing and, and talking about things and, and making that work because it's it is it is a really good way to to learn i i know that my meeting skills have gotten at least much better after 800 plus of these you know in, in a meeting i'm super comfortable I'm, I'm comfortable with my system i'm super comfortable with talking um and uh, unfortunately for everyone around me i'm super comfortable with interrupting everybody so um so the uh so, <laughs> which i do a lot of meetings um anyway so uh but i but i think that uh that's those are the big things you're more than welcome to jump on and, and even put stuff up for review for for us to look at um, and we're happy to give you feedback on that but it is a lot of practice and it's also just a lot of uh, most of what I learn is I look at people that I respect. I look at people who, wow, I really like that video. I really like their presentation. And then I start thinking about what those things, what are they doing that I like? You know, like, what is it about that presentation or that video? I mean, people that I, um, uh, that I, that I watch a lot and I just like their presentation is, uh, Destin from Smarter Every Day, um, Rene Ritchie, um, doing his videos, um, Marquez Brownlee, uh, I like just watching Justine's, it's just a lot of fun. I can never do that, but I like to watch it. Um, uh, audio university, uh, the, I can't think of the guy's name <laughs> and, it, and they're all very different. If you look at them, they're all very different presentations. I'm not looking for a model. There's something about them that I like. And so I try to figure out what it is about those presentations. I think I like Destin's, um, energy. Like he's just, he's got the guys really, really excited, you know, and, and he's excited about what he's learning. And, but, but with the Audio University and Marquez Brownlee, it's, it's a very calm, you know, presentation of, of this stuff. It's very to the point. It's very calm. Um, when you look at Rene, Rene is very focused, you know, and very matter of fact about those things. So those are, those are, you know, and then of course there's Leo who can do everything very, very naturally. <laughs> but I think that Leo is kind of a, uh, it, it kind of comes naturally for him. Go ahead, Chris. I think the main thing, the, the universal thing across that is being comfortable in their own skin. Yeah. And I think that a lot of it has to do, and I, this is one of the things that I coach with people that I'm, that I'm shooting is I'll tell them because I, I'm usually working with people that have never been on camera before, right. but they are subject matter experts, SMEs. So I'll say to them, there's a reason you're here. There is a reason that you've been asked to be here because you know this better than anybody else. And that really helps kind of take away some of the the mystery from people and right. remind them about why they're there. And I think that if you're going to be on camera, uh, hopefully you have a certain amount of 
comfor- comfortability, what's the word? And uh, that, that you do feel comfortable. And sometimes that's only, you know, making 50 bad videos before you, before you make the 51st one, which really sings. But you got to do it and, and just remind yourself that, you know, you, know, you understand this stuff and that's why you're there presenting. Yeah. And I, you, it's not a mistake that a lot of people in podcasting, a lot of people done well started in radio, you know, because they, you know, we got to do it. We got to, I got, I, for hundreds of times I got up and spent four hours a day <laughs> doing some presentation, you know, and that, that helps a lot. Um, next question. It's from Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina. As a backup home office, internet connection, how do Starlink and T-Mobile's 5G service compare? I was just notified I can order Starlink at my address, and it's very tempting. Good guy. Yeah, for backup using cellular, what we found is that when the provider goes out in the area, everybody jumps onto cellular. So all of a sudden, your cellular backup is getting down into the kilobit range. So we were getting you know less than one megabyte when our internet went down. And we have an SLA in our area. We have business class internet, and it's only gone out once in seven years. But that's that's also a, a business. Here uh, at home, I'd rather have a second hardwired connection. You know, because if you go cellular, that data cap. You know, let's say you get 20 gigs or whatever. Once you hit that, you're going to get throttled down. So Starlink looks good. I mean, but I'd, I'd really want to have it for the roaming capability. You know, if you get out in the desert where there are no cell towers, um, you know, 135 bucks. So it's 110 bucks a month, but then you can get that additional roaming if you have like an RV or you plan on going out doing live streaming like we do. I think that's even what uh, Jeff Keithley used on the, the rocket launch project. So 135 a month. But I'm interested in getting, I think, Alex, didn't you get one? I got one. Um, there's nowhere in my house, other than putting it on the roof, because I wanted to roam with it. Other than putting it on the roof, there's no place where I can get the full 360 of view of it. I think that when I bought it, I was like, I'm used to using satellite. And I was like, oh, I just need to get, I got a huge vision of the southern sky. So I was like, this will work great. And uh, it's, you have to really get the whole sky. You have to be able to, it has to be high enough that it sees the whole sky and there's nothing obscured. And um, that has been harder in my space than I thought it would be. Um, I'm about to send it out to somebody to p- test it where they are. I'm going to put add the roaming to it and get it out there um, to see how that works. I, I find that without being able to see the whole sky, it just drops out every once in a while long enough that I could never, I could use it for roaming and I could use it if, if things went out. I mean, like, I, you know, for like surfing, but uh, it doesn't, I don't view it as a, as a production streaming uh, platform because it goes out often enough that, that I can't, when it's on, it's great. When it's not, it's off, <laughs> you know? So, and I think it just has to do with the function. I'm losing about 10% of the sky. It's not like there's a lot of obstructions, but there's just like this little red edge when you, when you look around that's, that's down on one side and it seems to be enough to have it just drop out. And it tells you on the app, this is going to drop out every so many minutes, you know, like it's, it knows that if you don't have it, it tells you you're going to, you're going to have dropouts because you can't see the whole sky. So when you think about it, you have to make sure that especially in a wooded area or something, you have a place to put it, to get it, to get it to a point where I can really see everything, but it's not trivial. I go ahead, Sky. I had the experience of working with the T-Mobile hotspot in downtown Seattle. We had very good up and down because that's what we had to use at that, at that time. So that's one experience with that little device and their service. The Starlink, of course, we did use from the desert and I would reach out to Chris Widener, I believe. Is, is that Chris Fenwick? Yeah. Chris Widener, brought that and they learned a lot. And as far as I think the real magic was they just needed a three inch little cable to do the conversion. And that was the the missing link. But uh, again, it was out in the middle of the desert to Alex's point. So they had lots of, lots of visibility. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Big sky. Yeah. Um, so Alex, are you saying, does the, does the Starlink like switch between satellites yeah. like All a cellular time. connection does? Mm-hmm. But it's it's pointed straight up, and it has multiple satellites that it has to see multiple satellites all the time. So it's yeah, it's it's constantly. It's I, I don't think I think it's only looking at one at a time. But as but there's they are geostationary, and we're you know so, but they are well they're not usually. I think they're well, yeah. Anyway, no, Starlink is not geostationary. They're, they're not they're st- geostationary, moving. so they're always moving. So they're moving in and out of your aperture. So they're so you're you're you you have to look up, and so it knows. With the density that it has, if you don't see the sky, it knows that, oh, there's going to be some point where I can't see a satellite, you know, here for a moment until like, until the next one goes, goes past. So do you have a lot of big trees. I do. 
Yeah. I've got trees. I've got, I'm on a, a on a hill. So it a goes chainsaw. down. I'm just saying. I, I might have to, because one of them looks pretty, without the water, one of them looks a little, sorry for, uh, I don't know how long it's going to last. So that, that, that might get cleared up, but I'm on a hill too. So it just makes it hard. Anyway, uh, next question. Darren Cirillo in Dallas, Texas. I've got a Sennheiser MKH416 connected to a DBX286, then into a Scarlett Solo, and finally to my M1 Mac Mini. Am I shortchanging the microphone's capability by not using higher-end components in the chain? Was using the setup for light voice over work. Courtney. You may be shortchanging it by using too many components in the chain. Uh, the uh, MKH416 is a RF condenser, and it's known for its quietness and its lack of self noise and its high output uh, so that dbx is probably overkill unless you have something curious about your voice dbx is really designed for noise reduction or compression or uh, you know taking care of anomalies that you want to get rid of it depends if you have a good quiet location you know that you're you're speaking in a voice booth or something I'd remove it because it's probably going to add more noise than it gets rid of with the 416. And uh, just go directly into the Scarlett uh, uh, solo. Good, Mitchell. Yeah, Courtney's exactly right. The DBX, I like them, but that's the weak uh, link in your chain there. It's not a high-end compressor. If you're going to go with a high-end compressor, maybe uh, a plug-in to the Scarlett or something else, but just take it out. It's not good. I think Mickey would advise that also. Go ahead, uh, John. You got a great mic connected into two inferior pieces of gear in your audio chain. Get get a better preamp. Connect that mic into a better preamp interface. Yeah, I, you know the Scarlett is not going to be the best interface. Um, I think that I would be looking at Zoom or or uh, some of the higher end Zooms or or sound devices uh, are going to give you good preamps that are going to sound a lot better than what you're getting out of that Scarlett. Uh, it, it shouldn't make a massive difference for voiceovers. You know, almost anything that you have there could probably be filtered out. Um, you know, it, it, there might be a little bit of noise there, but uh, it's going to sound fine <laughs> for a voiceover. The Scarlet will work fine. Uh, it, I don't think it's it's that big of a deal in a controlled environment. I would agree that getting rid of the 286 is probably right. It, anything that's just a pure analog device is going to add some noise to the signal. And so does it really make a difference? That's something you can't do in software. And I think that we're past that now. Next question. Scott Mueller from Germantown, New York. Ask the question, speaking of Masterclass the other day, should Office Hours compile Zoom OSC, Isadora, and advanced Zoom production Masterclasses that have the collective wisdom of the Office Hours community and comprehensive courses? Go ahead, Sky. I love the word should. I mean, many things should happen, but it's, again, the resources. And while we have these amazing brain trust here in this community, it's the collection of that, the archiving of that, the, the uh, metadating of that. Again, we have some of that that's happened. I know uh, Jeffrey Powers did quite a bit of effort, but again, it, it takes time and effort. So don't disagree. Uh, back to Alex. Good guy. Yeah, those things uh, are expensive to produce. I think, Alex, you said that you saw about 30 people coming onto the studio lot. When oh, you, those master when you classes. Them oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they shoot some of the master classes in the stage that that uh, that, that, is, that, we're, that we just did a concert from last night. And the, um, uh, the and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a big production. <laughs> like, it's not, you know, they're, they're definitely spending more than $10 on them. So what, what comes to mind with with that is that most of those are evergreen. So when you're looking at the content that you're describing there, the Zoom OSC, it comes out with updates. And so you want this stuff to live on. And the folks that are on Masterclass, they're getting paid 100 Gs up front. Um, up, I just read an article just yesterday, 100,000 bucks up front uh, and then 30% of of the take. So we're not talking little bits. You got lots to, lots to play with, lots of scripting to do if, when you, you're talking that kind of money. So Thomas Keller made a lot of money. All right, go ahead, uh, Chris. That's uh, that's an interesting uh, pricing schedule. I think, um, what's the line, Alex? I, I wrote you a long letter because I didn't have time to write you a short letter. Um, uh, that masterclass exists, and it's right here. Uh, between what we discuss here on office hours and the various labs that happened quite often in after hours, um, all of that stuff is taught. However... <laughs> It takes a while to get through it because we're talking about a lot of other things also. Right. It is a neat idea to try and condense it 
but from a ed, uh, um, an educational standpoint, it would be very difficult to design that in such a way that it was modular enough that you could update it when the software gets updated and things change and best practices. You know, I mean, if you think about it, the things that we did two years ago, nobody does that anymore because it's all the software has changed and Zoom has changed, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's, it's, it's all out there. It's just, it, it's here, it's right here. Yeah, I mean, when you look at even just some of the announcements that Zoom made over the last uh, couple of days, it invalidated a bunch of stuff that we would normally do. And by the end of the summer, there'll be like a whole bunch of things that weren't, by the time we finish the videos, there'll be a whole bunch of things that aren't valid anymore, you know? And so, um, you know, cause especially now that things are moving in this area, <laughs> Zoom OSC, Isadora and advanced Zoom production, this is gonna move faster than almost any other part of the media industry for the next two years. You know, as as Liminal kind of applies their, <laughs> <laughs> their spell, you know, on broadcast, I think that we're going to see just this incredible push forward at Zoom um, of broadcast solutions. And so I think that that's going to be, I don't think this is the right time to try to codify it. Um, you know, I think we just, we're just going to try to keep up, you know, keep on giving you reports from the, from the front lines of what it takes to do it. And I, again, I think that's what we're doing here. Um, we also have this incredible resource. L is, he's going to now be doing it in the morning instead of the afternoon. I mean, you have the, I mean, one of the world experts in Isadora and someone who completely understands OSC and, and, and he is, he hangs out with us for as long, pretty much as long as we want for an hour, but an hour or two a, a week answering your questions and showing little things and everything else. And so if you're interested in this, it's going to now be Thursday mornings at 9 a.m. in after hours after this, there'll be a breakout. And, um, man. Like it's just, you know, and, and we, we're not taking advantage of that resource um, of, uh, effectively. So I'd highly recommend taking a look at it because, and we hope to do more of those. We hope to, you know, my goal is to eventually have a lot more after hour sessions. I mean, someday, you know, I, I'm hoping that we have uh, office hours running 24 seven, you know, going out to lots of locations, but then there's this whole substructure of after hours. that's constantly, you know, having just labs that everyone just kind of, you know, that's not the office hour. The office hours thing is much more focused. And then there's after hours, it has all these labs that are just constantly going on that we're all figuring out where we want to go. But I think the labs are really valuable, um, you know, and putting the knowledge, you know, in the, the knowledge is much more effective in a group of people if they're, if they are um, persistent. So what we've done is we've created this persistent community and we're dumping that knowledge into it because when you dump the knowledge into a video or a book, it stays exactly the same as it was before. And when you dump it into people, it keeps growing you know, and they keep on interacting with each other and it keeps on getting better. So that's what we want to keep on doing. Next question. The seventh scroll in Brooklyn, New York. Morning, guys. What are your thoughts on Forbes piece on Grant Petty and the trajectory of black magic design? Go ahead, Mitchell. I watched it. I, it was very interesting. It was short, but I think it was the right length. What's very interesting I learned watching it about uh, Grant is that he doesn't have it a what we'll call it an official entrepreneurial background. He's uh, he's a guy that <laughs> is there an official entrepreneurial background? I'm not sure if that's yeah. There is. I mean, somebody went to special college and learned electrical engineering. No special. That that's that's the, that's how you become someone who works at a big company. <laughs> to have that. His background was working in a production studio. And he thought it was a better way to do it and a lot cheaper way to do it. And he sort of built his thing. In fact, he said that in the uh, the video. Um, that he uh, pursued venture capital, but uh, they weren't interested because they didn't understand the business model. So he just said they built everything that they built on top of the successes yeah. that preceded it, which is a cool way to do things. I'm not sure he's actually said that that he pursued venture capital. I think he just said no venture capitalist would would put money into this. Um, you know, you know, okay. and so that I, I I don't think that he has. I think that he's. I don't think he would give up any control over what he does. Um, I think what he's done is pretty amazing. Like he's, you know, he has literally just bootstrapped a company into a, you know, basically a billion dollar company. I mean, I, I think they, they said the revenues in, are over $500 million a year. And I mean, they are the, they are one of those companies that is the fast moving next generation companies of our industry. You know, there's a handful of them that you see at NAB that you can just see them growing and that's definitely one of them. And, uh, and it's changed the whole industry. Yeah, it's really interesting. Next question. From Olivier Rochard in Saigon, Vietnam, uh, he wants to know um, we do how do to. we how do we get to the panel? I'm sorry, just changed it around me. I think we have to do some. I, sh I should probably put it back in the announcements because I I actually don't know. 
I don't know how people get on the panel. I think they get it. They, I think that somebody, uh, I, I think somebody gets on Discord, you know, on Discord. They're like, how do I get on the panel? And then, or someone asked it, maybe someone can raise their hand here. Cause I actually, when new people show up, I realized that I, when, when I saw this question, I was trying to think of the answer. And I was like, I don't really know if I know the answer of how to there get on the panel. There might be a hole in our strategy here, Alex. We may have, <laughs> we may have made the, the, the so for, fort too hard get, to get into. Yeah, the the rickety go bridge. We, the, Got to go around to the stage door and slip Smitty a 20 and he'll let you in. <laughs> and Smitty looks a lot like Chris. And, and so, um, yeah, go ahead, Sky. Yes, I received a, uh, a link. And you, there, I think the, the metaphor is a theater. So to your, to your joke, mm-hmm. yeah, there, there is a link that you go to a Zoom instance and you're, mm-hmm. you're met and greeted by some very lovely people there and they help you check your, your systems and then they will push you into the stage. So it's, it's very much the metaphor of a theater and, and you gotta say the right thing. No, no, I think no, the big thing is so- middle though. You can't, I mean, you can't find that link unless you're in the panel There's chat the, right, that's, the panel well, that's chat. why I'm working so, backwards from what I know. <gasps> so I, I, I was, I've been thinking about this this week actually. So the timing is very good that um, I am probably going to in the next uh, couple of weeks, because I, I've been pondering like, w- w- number one is that we used to, in the announcements, you know, b- before the way it worked now, in the announcements, I would go, if you want to be a panelist, just come in early and raise your hand and da 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 But you can't do that anymore because we're in a different meeting and we're not really, you know, doing that. And so, um, so one of the things that uh, I realized is I got to figure out how to show people how to do that because I think that w- there's no good way to get in anymore. And I, I don't even know how the people who knew people who show up, show up. I think they just ask somebody, like they reach out to Chris or, or Guy or- Mitch. I don't know how to do it. I mean, no, he, there's, I, I, I mean I'll tell you what down. I do. I have a text file and that text file has a link and I yeah, click exactly. on that link and it takes me right into Mukana. Once I'm into Mukana, there somebody, I think it's JJ, always puts a link. Here's the link to the thing. Yeah. I don't know where to get that thing except for that. I think there's a real problem here, no, Alex. No, I think I this do. needs to be addressed <laughs> right now. I like, know. I don't know what you're doing today, but what you should it's be doing be today, today is fixing this. Yeah, yeah. So, so because it, because we, we get clear, like when I run into folks, like just this incredible, you know, resources that are here and we don't, we don't give enough people enough access to it. So we'll, we'll work on, I, what, what I was going to say is that I think that I'm going to, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to do a, probably a, a panelist orientation. So if you're interested in being a panelist, we'll have a breakout room. You can come in, we can talk about it. We'll see if people can, you know, maybe some of the panelists will show up and we'll talk about it, our experience of it. But just so that you know how to do it and what it looks like and what the expectations are, I think that would be a lot helpful. That'd be helpful. And the thing to remember is that once you get in the panel, you don't have to say anything the first couple of times. You can just be in the panel, <laughs> just see how it goes, see what, see what it feels like. And then, you know, add an answer to or two. And then just, and before just, you know it, you'll one. be answering all the questions like Mitchell. Warn TJ, good guy. Warn, warn TJ and Chad, please. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, uh, guy. Yeah, the uh, the gentleman who's asking Olivier, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, was in um, after hours yesterday morning, and a couple of people were fascinated by his knowledge, and we were just like, "You should be on the panel. You should be on the panel." So it's great that he's asking because I must have talked to him for twenty minutes just about flight instruction, and well, he, he's doing some fascinating yeah. things with the future of uh, flight education because there's a shortage of pilots and going into 2050, I believe was the number he threw out there. There's going to be a big shortage unless they get trained up. So he's trying to figure it out and he's got his ATEM and he's doing some really cool keynote animations. And he's like, I whipped this together in five minutes. I'm like, whoa, that's awesome. He was, uh, Olivia was showing, was showing the, um, uh, you know, how they calculate everything before they take off and, and the weights and everything else. And I was like, okay, you have to be on this for a second hour. <laughs> so, so we're going to get him on to come on for a second hour. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, you should have them um, put on the website. There needs to be a link to want to be on yeah. the panel. Follow this link and, you know, you'll Follow the you a crowd. PDF of explains how to do it with links. <laughs> yeah, so, you're right. Go ahead, Chris. So apparently there's a website. I found it. It's called officehours.global. I do say and that part on of the said end. website, there's a schedule. And if you click on that, it says at the top of the page, click here to join the daily Zoom conversation. Oh, and yeah, it the... says we distribute the link for Discord in Mukana. Oh, but that's just so yeah. confusing. It is. It is. We've been... it's fine. And to we'll be fair, out. Alex, I think I told you this like a year ago. Like, wait, wait, we need to make this more streamlined. No, nope, yeah. nope. I want the. I want it to be. I want there to be a rickety bridge or whatever. There is. You, have to, the, you have to go up the mountain and then across the rickety bridge and through the dangerous forest. That's that's. Somebody's that's watched Lord of the Rings too many times. Uh, Princess Bride. Uh, next question. 
Okay, uh, Scott Mueller from Germantown, New York. With the popularity of the A10 Minis, why hasn't Blackmagic released a deck link with four or more HDMI outputs? Is there a technical limitation, or is there not the market for HDMI that the SDI version has? I thought that they did have one that has four out. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. I don't think that they have one that has four ins. Uh, oh, a lot yeah, of the deck links were, were set up to record inputs, and they had four HDMI inputs. Some of them had two HDMI outputs. But the problem is, you know, most computers these days have multiple HDMI outputs, so you really don't need a deck link card to get multiple s screen outs out of your computer, uh, you know, into your ATEM. So if that's what you're looking to use the deck link card for, uh, so I'm not sure why they're interested in using the deck link other than wanting to get three or four screens out of a single computer. Um, yeah. And most computers you can get three screens out of pretty much. I, yeah, and I, and I don't know. I think that there also could be an issue where it uses a lot of graphics processing in a way that video, SDI, SDI is treated differently. Um, so it might be that as well. Interesting. Uh, I don't know. Next question. The Seventh Scroll of from Brooklyn, New York is here. What are your thoughts on the likelihood of the Blackmagic 6K Pro G2 releasing anytime soon? I think it's very low. I don't, I, you know, I don't think there's a lot for them to add to that form factor. I mean, I think that they fixed a bunch of things that really felt like they needed to be fixed in the, in the, for the G2. Um, but I'd be really surprised if I saw them do it. I mean, I, I might be surprised, but I'd be surprised if, if they released one anytime soon. Good guy. Yeah, I can't think of any features unless there's not enough horsepower to do what we're seeing in the the bigger, the Ursa G2, which has the streaming in it. So I was playing with that mm -hmm. at Infocom, and we actually ran some tests. I grabbed Photo Joseph. He was actually working the Blackmagic booth. We kind of commandeered things and uh, set up some tests right there live on the floor. It was kind of funny, but we because it's still in beta. So um, a lot of times the firmware will catch up, but sometimes the hardware is the limiting factor. Um the um, Blackmagic Pocket 6K uh, G2 is shipping today. Like, we land them today. So for those of you that were wondering when they're going to arrive, they're real and they're shipping and they're arriving. So watch them today. I will say Blackmagic has gotten so much better at that. You know, they, they for a long time, Blackmagic, we knew that when they announced something that would happen before the next NAB, because they wouldn't want to try to be at the next NAB explaining why they didn't, ship the thing that from the last NAB, but until then, it didn't matter. <laughs> Go ahead, Mitchell. I don't know if they're subject to the same chip shortages that everybody else seems to be. Oh, I think um, they, they seem to have some kind of a system where they cornered the market on them. I don't know. Uh, no, I think, there, I think there's a lot of products we're not seeing. I think there's adjustments, I believe, and I have no proof of this. I believe that the reason that the HyperDeck Pros came out without XLR uh, in, in and out is because of the AD, the DA converters and AD converters, um, because that's crazy to have a pro version without a, you know, it just seems so crazy. The only reason I could think of it is they wanted to update everything else about the product and there was no way to, to do that. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think it's, uh, if you look at the features of some of the devices and like the, well, whatever you just said, uh, I think I think that's evidence of the fact that they're absolutely being um, affected yeah. by this chip I think shortage. Everybody is to some chaos. degree. I, I think that Black Magic would be releasing like five times more products if they weren't caught up with it. They're doing what they can with what they have. I think that that that's really what we're seeing. Um, next question from Douglas Carmichael. Excuse the dog in the background. Alex, the second hour about working in the White House was beautifully presented. What about a second hour about your experiences in Africa and building ADMA? For some reason, I thought I already did one about that, but I, maybe I didn't. Maybe it was before we started recording. So, yeah, we'll do another one. Uh, I, I love talking about it. And we have a new building now. <laughs> we're in a new building. It took us years uh, to, get, to get into the new building. So that we, were, we spent, it wasn't 40 years in the wilderness, but we spent like four uh, wandering around uh, as nomads. And so now we're, uh, we're back in a building. So, uh, yeah, we'll see if we can do that. Maybe we can even, I think what I'll do is I'll see if we can't get um, some folks from ADMA to join, maybe from the classroom. That'd be kind of fun. Like it's some port, port, port of it. Uh, next question. Jason Robert Shaw from uh, Sarasota, Florida. How would you connect audio for one host and four guests on a small talk show style couch set for a live stream Zoom program? Studio is 24 by 17 by 13. Budget is less than $1,000. Control with mixers separate from the studio. All right, go ahead, Courtney. Uh, well, it depends on whether it's going to be manned or not. You know, if you're 
a one man band or something, I would go with some uh, mic stands with some um, SM58s on them and go into a Zoom F6, which would give you auto mix capabilities uh, and give you six inputs and has a USB interface to get into Zoom. Uh, and to do streaming, and it also has the ability to record 32-bit float and ISOs and uh, auto mix. So it has a lot of those capabilities uh, for under under a thousand dollars. It's only about 695 bucks, and leaves you some room to buy the microphones and stands. Good, Chris. I don't know that 32-bit float is going to help you in a live situation. Um, Jason, you say you you have a budget of $1,000. I think if I only had $1,000 to apply to this audio problem, I would hire a hungry and enthusiastic audio engineer and say, just make it sound good. Um, you're not going to be able to buy enough stuff to do it for $1,000. You're just not. Even if you buy five SM58s at 105 bucks a piece, I mean, there goes half your budget. Hire somebody and just let them do it probably you're going to end up, if you're on camera and they're sitting on a couch, honestly, they're probably going to be on lobs. It's not going to sound like a radio show. It's going to sound like a talk show, but it, but it's also going to look like a talk show. And that helps the audio fit a little better. Yeah, I can't remember whether the XR18s have auto mix in them or not. I think that they do. Um, I, I believe that the XR18s, the, the Behringer XR18s, um, I think have that. Um, but but the uh, but if not, I, I think the labs that you you know in a little talk show, I'm not a big fan of labs. But if you're trying to create a talk show experience, I think you're looking at uh, Sure 150s are probably the right. I mean, those are the kind of the they're not super expensive. They're um, I think about 150 bucks each or 170 dollars each. You get four of those, um, and then get you might go a little over a thousand dollars, but than like the XR12 or XR18, you do want something. If anybody, anytime you're gonna do labs on a couch, the one thing, that's part I can't remember about the XR18, you need auto mixing. Like you have to have the auto mixing with the labs sit, sitting around a, a couch. I mean, you don't have to, but wow, it makes a big difference. So this is a Dugan auto mix is what you're really looking for. Um, I believe that the XR18 was part of that whole lawsuit or not lawsuit, but the troubles. <laughs> between Dan Dan Dugan and and Behringer because Behringer said we were doing Dugan like auto mixing which because the Dugan patents ran out but they really wanted to connect it to because no one understands what auto mixing is if you don't put Dugan in front of it because he's the the uh, the, the OG <laughs> so so anyway um, uh, so anyway so look for auto mixing in a in a mixer uh, that's going to make the big diff difference and that's why you want a digital mixer over an analog mixer in my opinion. Um, I do believe the Zoom might have that actually built into in, into the automix. So um, what Courtney had suggested could could work well uh, in these environments. I've mostly used XR18s, but I don't, but not in not not for. We've used XR18s for a lot of things when it's less than a thousand dollars, but uh, I haven't used it for a roundtable, so I don't I don't know if that would work or not. Uh, next question. Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas, has a question. Alex, what phone will you use with the Matterport Axis? What are you uh, going to be doing with it? And what's the ETA? The Axis showed up yesterday. I haven't opened it yet because I have to figure out what we're going to I think there needs to be, an, uh, you know, we'll have an unboxing. I think you'll probably get a random uh, in Discord. Usually I just, you'll just say, hey, everybody, I'm going to do an unboxing of the Matterport. And uh, we'll do a matter, we'll do an unboxing of it and take a look at it. Um, it's uh, This is a, a spherical rig that you can put your phone on. Matterports are something you can build kind of virtual tours. Um, I will... Uh, I have to admit, I meant to do it to our stage before we tore it down today, but I'm not going to have time. I don't think so. I don't think that's going to happen. So anyway, so the um, so I think that it'll just be what it is. Um, the uh, but we'll probably do some stuff of the stage and of the theater and stuff like that and around our office. It's probably where I'll test it first. Uh, I don't have high expectations. It's not very expensive. The mat last Matterport that I had cost me five grand. So be only having to pay two hundred bucks for that and a one year license or whatever pretty good deal to me so um so if it just takes the pictures and doesn't you know but it's it's supposed to use some of the lidar we'll see good chris yeah those matterport tours that they do for uh real estate i think they're really cool and I'll i think they're you, awesome one of our um one of our clients that does high-end uh real estate we we make a bunch of videos for them they do a matterport tour of all of their houses that they saw and what when I first saw it, I was like, oh, we should get into this. And then I found out 
I looked into the business behind oh, it yeah. and how much the realtor actually pays for it. I was like, oh, I don't want to touch that. There's no money in that. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah, no, no we, money in that. Like five years or four or five years ago when we got into Ozos, we talked about doing, and I probably would have made a lot of money doing this now, but we talked about doing virtual like live streams from it so that you could just, you could visit a house, you know, virtually and talk to the realtor and you could the realtor could just talk to 200 people at one time and like just show them all the house and just go from house to house to house. We have a little truck with, cause I had like six of these Ozos. And so we could, um, we could just give you like this great tour uh, of the house, but it would cost us, you know, a lot of money and it would only, you could only do it with houses that we, we did the math. And the only way it would pencil out is if, if all the houses were worth more than $2 million. And of course I was like, well, there's not that many houses like that. <laughs> and then with the current, the current environment. Good luck finding a house for under 2 million in the Bay area these days. Yeah, yeah exactly. Those are tear downs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, next question. It comes from me. How did the, or can we discuss how the illegals practice went last night? I thought it was kind of fun. Did you enjoy it, Mitchell? I did. I thought it was it was very interesting. There was a little glitch. I think your monitor was a little loud. So I was hearing the drums effects before they actually played. So it was like a, a one right. one or two second uh, delay. But I was fascinated with the way you gave direction. You're very calm, cool, collected, and give precise directions to the camera operators who, you know, God, God love them, uh, were not expert camera operators. But yet you got the results. That was cool. You know, it's, you know, I think that I'm... Y- yeah, I mean, to, to be fair, I think one of the camera operators uh, had never done it before. Like, well, like when I say not experienced, had never done it, used a game, you know, I had never shot anything like that before and was doing great, you know? And, you know, and, and the thing is, is that the one thing I've learned about camera operators is, ne- is that there's definitely a huge, like when you get someone who shoots concerts all the time, um, they come in and the, there's, the TD tells them almost nothing. They're just finding great shots and the TD says, okay, now I wanna do this, now I wanna do this, I wanna do this. And, um, and so, and we'll probably see some of that um, for a variety of reasons. Marcia wasn't able to join us um, for this last one, but she can bring in ringers that are from all over San Francisco that you know, there, um, you know, that, that can make that look good. I love the idea. I love, um, I've done this all over the world of taking people who don't have a lot of experience and then just working with them to get a product out and then they learn a lot. You know, they, that's probably the, because the fastest way to learn is to have someone who's patient pushing you along to just get what they need out of it without it, without, you know, there's enough pressure to, there's enough pressure to get it done that you get it done, but there's not so much pressure that you blow up, you know, and it is the, if you can get to that, that level, it's a great, and, you know, I think that, I know JJ enjoys it. JJ was one of the camera operators and our other camera operator, um, uh, uh, Brian, um, you know, I think he had a lot of fun. <laughs> like he definitely seemed like he had a good time at the end. And I, and I love, I love the idea that, because I think the best way to learn everything is just to do it, you know, but if you can do it with someone who knows what they're doing right behind you, and then you just get this kind of support structure. Now that's not very scalable. <laughs> like it's very hard to do that, but wow, can you learn? Like I learned how to model an alias studio in about two weeks because I had two of the best modelers in the world at ILM sitting next to me while I was learning it. You know, like they'd come in for two or three hours a day and just give me coaching. Before I knew it, I was like, I could do do everything I needed to do. And so that is the way to learn. It's just that it isn't scalable. And so if I, I'm really committed that as we get bigger, you know, I'm trying to get more physical space because I want to give more members opportunities to do that. It's just to come in and get their hands dirty. And we know that you haven't done it before. We're not going to be upset about it. <laughs> We're just doing what we can. And, you know, this was just a test for us. We were the, the only camera that, the only camera that for me that, that mattered was the center camera that we had framed up because I was testing something very specific around head height. Um, and um, everything else was for the band. Like, we're just going to give that footage back to the band to um, for their for their stuff. So so it was, we didn't need to get some good footage, but we had lots of lock offs as well. So it was a really good kind of just enough stress without too much. Go ahead, Tony. I, I just wanted to say as a total, totally novice person, as far as the, the experience was concerned, I enjoyed it immensely. And one of the things that I ran into was I was trying to get as many people as possible to see it because I, I just thought that particularly those of us who have no experience at all, that it was something to to watch. And I I hope to, you know, maybe one day, do the camera thing. I, 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 you know, I want to give it a shot. I mean, the, the goal, the goal for me down the road, like when I look at the pro- progression of this is that 
that people in office hours watch the end product and they think the end product is great, or even just people not in office hours, they watch the end product and think it's great. Then they go, I want to learn more about it. And then they watch the behind the scenes and they listen to the comms and they listen to, and they listen to the input and they, and they watch that over and over and over again. They just see those over and over and over again. They get a sense of what we're looking for and they get a sense of what it is. Then they show up <laughs> and they, and they take on different roles. They do a camera operation. They do, uh, they, they cut the cameras. They, they do other things. They, they learn how to do the audio. They learn all those things. Um, and then they do that for a little while. So they really understand it. And then they start to teach it. You know, that's the full circle where they start teaching other people who are now coming in. That's the virtuous kind of cycle that we hope to hope to create. And you see that still happening here from Pixel Core when, when Nick Justin shows up and, and shows it. I mean, he started in Pixel Core learning how to learning all the basics that you're learning and now he's teaching us. And so that's that's the thing we always hope that we, we see. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, there's, I got two more comments to add to it. It must have been weird to walk down the aisle of the audience there and it's maybe almost silent other than the, uh, the natural sound from the band playing. Um, it's just must be a completely different, uh, uh otherworldly experience. Yeah, and, uh, the other, yeah, the, the other quick question is that the people really realize that this is being driven by people all over the world. It's just amazing that you're doing that. Well, Tlaloc, you know, for those watching Tlaloc and Benjamin were actually running the lights, um, you know, from, I think Benjamin somewhere in the Bay Area. I mean, he's in Palo Alto, I think. And then Tlaloc is in North Carolina and the two of them are sitting there talking to each other and working on the lights. And, and, um, and then of course, Mickey is managing all the audio from the Philippines and, you know, and, and the fact that we don't think about it at all, like, we're just like, oh yeah, yeah, we're just going to do that. You know, like, it's not like the facility is just, just run seamlessly, you know, through that, through that process. It's, it's quite, a, it's quite a thing. And again, my goal is to turn that facility or other facilities into something where there's just, it's like everything, almost everything. There's a handful of people on site that do the things that are on site and everything else is run remotely. And we just learn and we use it as a big test case and how to learn. I am going to tell everyone that we're going to run, we're running really slow today um, in the questions and I like it. I'm not, I didn't feel like there was any need to rush. I know that my, I, I will tell you, we are going to do the 3D thing because I told I, you would, but we're going to run a little over because we've got tons of questions sitting here. I'm going to go ahead and answer some of them because I know that my presentation is relatively short. <laughs> so, so um, uh, next question. And it's from Chris Fenwick uh, in Emeryville, California. Mix pre-10 setup. Can we discuss Predo's problem or should it be an after hours discussion? Sure, Chris, what's up? So, <clears throat> Preto got his new uh, Mix Pre 10 because he wanted to have more input channels than me. And um, we were having, we, we know, so uh, I'm going to try and make this a uh, uh, little background informational. The Mix Pre is a great device. It's a super confusing device. Um, the people that um, all they ever do all day long is wear that thing around their neck and stare at the controls. Uh, uh, they deserve uh, more money than they're getting paid because it's a uh, it's a really powerful tool with a very tiny user interface. That being said, mini menus, a lot of stuff to dig through. The trick is when you're using it for a, uh, an audio interface for a computer, is you have to set up the USB connection to the computer. We did that. We got the computer into the Mix Pre. Um, and we got the output from the mix pre. There's a way to set what you're sending out to the USB one and two. We got all that. We got John's mic working. What we couldn't do. Oh, and we know how. Here's the other thing that you have to do with the mix pre. You have to set up a, um, a headphone preset. So you have to tell the mix pre what things you want to send to your head. And we did that. We have the left channel from the computer over here and the right channel from the computer over here. And we send his microphone to the headphones, but he couldn't hear his microphone in the headphone. And, oh, and once you, here's the other thing. Once you set up a headphone preset, you have to select that headphone preset, <clears throat> excuse me, as the thing you're listening to in your headphones. And I think we did that too, didn't we, John? We, it, the, the preset one is green on that one screen, right? Meaning yep. it's selected. Yep. And yet he can't hear himself in his headphones. And I was wondering, I don't, I know that uh, Guy, Guy is very familiar with it. Alex, I know you're familiar. If you guys can think of anything else that we may have missed so that John can hear himself as a side tone. Oh, also we selected his microphone as a uh, post fader in the, um, 
in the thing. And when he talks through the mix pre, we hear him out in the universe uh, through Zoom because we selected the mix pre as the input to Zoom. So we, we, we've seemingly done everything, but he, we still, he still can't hear a side tone. This is where all of us go, well, I'm thinking about this, and we're all staring at the thing waiting for Nikki to put in the comment. <laughs> I will also say, I'd also like to say that in the spirit of office hours and, you know, uh, in the uh, historical relevance of Pixel Core, of people passing on information, I have sort of taken this as my my challenge to help John with this without bothering Mickey, because Mickey was so gracious giving me input. So I'm trying to pass it on, but I'm realizing okay. I'm ill-equipped. So, so you're, you're, we're all ill-equipped. I think, I think that what we need to do is, is your, your mission, if you choose to accept it, uh, is to go into After Hours and figure it out with Mickey and then come back and report on how well, it went. You can do when, a Cochrane and we throw yourself it out, a question. We'll, we'll do that. Yeah, just, just, just figure it out, come back, and we expect to report on, on it. I, I, I will say that um, uh, I, I want to see if we can, I think we need to do a mixed pre second hour, just like, just to talk about how it works and the structure and how it makes sense. And we probably need to do some labs. There's so many of us. How many people in this group have a mixed pre? Just want to see how many. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it's, it is, uh, it, I think that there's an enormous number of us that have mixed pre's. It's probably worth doing a mixed pre. I, I have a, th I have a feeling if we did a mixed pre second hour once a month, we'd probably be filled with questions of we could do mix pre week mix, this week no, I, this week no, not a whole week not a whole week yeah i i don't like i like just a little bit of drab so we can think about it so anyway but yeah i think that i think that's something we have to think about all right next question all right next one comes from me i'm asking what app can you use to rip dvds I go ahead courtney well it depends um there's uh win dvd plus i think is the uh i'm trying to find it here here we go. Um, that uh, our WinX DVD Ripper Platinum tends to be the highest rated one that's out there. It is cross-platform. You can use it on Mac or Windows. It has a good a lot of things. I've been using DVD Decryptor and DVD Squeeze for many years, and Handbrake is also used for it. Uh, this one, though, seems to be the highest rated. WinX DVD Ripper Platinum. Yeah, go ahead, Doug, Tom. Well, I do a two-step process. I always start with Make MKV, and the reason I chose that product is not only will it do DVDs, but it will do Blu-rays. And then I follow up with running it through Handbrake. Yeah, go ahead, Sky. Yeah, I my go-to is Handbrake. The challenge, though, is how do you find the the spinner? How do you where do you put that in? And so I had to physically go out and buy the the physical uh, thing that you put the DVD into. And it now has USB into the computer. So okay. yes, you can buy the cartridge. What is it called? The caddy? The yeah. drive. And the drive. DVD yeah. drive. Yeah. Yeah. There you yeah. That's the DVD R R W. Yeah. Go ahead, Mitchell. You know, it's funny how the question came up because uh, my business partner said, "Yeah, I got a DVD. I need to get the material off of it." And I got to thinking, when was the last time I did that? It's been years. And I used to use Roxio, but I don't even know if that still works. And I've got a Plextor drive, by the way. Well, and, and 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 you're trying to get uh, video off of it, right? Um, yes. You know, not not a. Uh, you're not trying to get. Um, uh, you're not trying to get data off of it. Not ripping a movie either. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. So, so I think that. Um, yeah, I think that. Um, I'm trying to think of what I have here. I was trying to find it really quickly. I have a Pioneer uh, piece. Of, what is this? A Pioneer BDR XS07 UHD portable six times Ultra HD 4K Blu-ray burner. <laughs> so that's that's what I that's what I have um, that I use for that. And I don't do it very often. Um, and I use Handbrake to grab onto the things. So go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, the other thing is what I use is um, if you have a DVD player somewhere in your video system, is play it back. Take the HDMI output out of that player and run it into a recorder, which is, you know, yeah. one of those little $100 H.264 recorders. And then you can just go to any index or any portion of that DVD you want to capture and just capture that segment of it uh, without having to transfer the whole DVD and recompress it and retransfer right. it. It's a lot easier. I find that what's interesting is the reason I'm ripping some of them is that for whatever reason, some DVDs and Blu-rays aren't playing properly in my brand new you know, relatively brand new Blu-ray and DVD player for my for my TV. 
And I find that the only way to watch them is to rip them <laughs> like, like that. Like I literally can't, they won't play back. So uh, like the gods must be crazy and uh, something else, a, a couple other ones. I literally, the only way to watch them, is I had to rip it to play it back. It's a crazy thing. The gods must crazy is really funny, by the way. It's completely inappropriate, but, but funny. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, it's almost as if you don't exercise it um, every so often. They just cease to operate. I've got a yeah. very expensive Pioneer that just, it just skips and complains and does all kinds, as does my Plex store, because I just haven't used it in years. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry, next question. Then next Chris. question coming in from Michael Fosbean in Woodstock, Georgia. Where can I find tutorials on cutting live streamed videos? Most of what I find is gear oriented. Good, Chris. Yeah, for that last question, you might want to get one of those cleaning DVDs and put that in. It's just, anyway, uh, brand so new, brand new I, love this, I love this question, Michael, because quite often we uh, over obsess about this gear and this cable and this adapter and this thing. Um, I'll give you the same advice because I, I think what you're saying is, how do I cut a show? Now, there's, there's two ways or switch a show, I think is the word. Uh, no, cutting. So... Um, there's two ways to look at that. Um, how do I push the buttons? Eh, push the buttons. Or what am I looking at and what do I want to go to? And I'll give you the same advice I give everybody about editing. I say, look, editing is ultimately at its core. Editing is very easy. You put all the pictures on the timeline, all the videos, and then you press play. And at the point that you don't like it, something has to change. So change it. Now, the difference between somebody who's done it for decades and you learning how to edit is that um, somebody who's done it for a long time will probably get to an end result quicker than you will. But it, the same thing is for cutting a live show. Watch the show. When you don't like what you're looking at, change it. Now, it may very well be that there's nothing else to go to. In which case, congratulations, you're in the middle of producing a bad show that you don't want to watch. But if you have options, look at them, evaluate them, and are they better than what you're looking at? Um, the rest of it is, did you prep it properly ahead of time? And I think that that's the fascinating part of this business because a real pro, a real good producer will set the director or the person who's switching that show up for success by giving them the bits and the parts that they need in order to be able to have good choices. And then you just watch it until you don't like it and change it. You're good, Sky. I'm going to point you to a friend of mine, Stephen Hullfish. He has a book out called The Art of the Cut. And he is best known for interviewing many editors and their styles. And the, the other secret would be whatever you're doing, does it move the story forward? That's the the whole whole point. Yeah, and and I and I will say the best way to listen, the, the best way to learn how to do this is to listen to other TDs cut a show. It is there is no, especially people who are really good. So when we've had Nate on calling shows, when we've had Marcia on calling shows, you, you know that they have done thousands of these. And what you're going to hear them do when you start to listen to them is you hear them. They're thinking they're thinking five shots down the road for, you know, you know, like I'm going to do this, 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 and you'll hear them cue everybody up. Okay. I'm going to come from you to you, to you, to you. I want you to spin over here. I want you to do this thing. And, and then they tell okay, everybody go, you know, go, 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 go. And, and they, and they can coordinate all the cameras and everything else. And that's a, you know, that's like a master move that, that you don't, you won't get to immediately. I'm not there very often, you know, on doing those things. And so, but I think, and we're going to, again, try to, provide more opportunities for you to see them do those things. But again, I think that that is where exactly what I talked about before, which is that you, you want to do it. And again, even the most simple things like cutting office hours in the back end or, or working with some of the other shows, whether it's Tony's show or, or Lois's show, getting back there and doing it. It's not sure it's not a concert, but but you're going to learn things like, oh, right, I, I should have. There's cadence and process and in, in, in how you're doing it that you're going to learn by by taking on those shows remotely that will help you get ready for the next step of what, what that looks like. Uh, next question. And coming in from Douglas Carmichael, Andy Carluccio's mentioned the Zoom Global Emerging Talent, or GET. Uh, could a program to help physical event AV lighting pros transition to the virtual world benefit us? 
I think it does. I mean, any, any, you bring anybody in with those things could benefit us. I think that, uh, you know, it's just a matter of right now, they would just have to show up, <laughs> you know? So, and I think that they're, you know, I think, but, but I think that at some point um, we've done a fair bit of training for pros in this industry for different parts of this. Like I used to do free trainings for local 16 in, in, in San Francisco because I needed more people that knew how to use black magic hardware. And so it gave me, you know, so I just did it purely selfishly. Now I did it for free. So local 16 thought it was great. And it also meant that I, you know, they took care of me when I needed help with getting things done. Um, but what I was looking for is a, who's adventurous enough to show up, B, how do they present themselves while they're here? And so, and then see, train them all in how to do it. So everyone walks away with a bunch of training. What I knew is the six people I needed to hire next, I mean, who are my must-haves, <laughs> you know, that, that I was gonna fill my teams with. Cause I did my, when I do union stuff in, at least in San Francisco, the whole team is must-haves. Like I don't, I'm not asking for a TD. I want this one, this one, this one, this one. I'm willing to pay an extra five bucks an hour for that. Go ahead, Chris. Um, I think it's a great idea, I literally just, just uh, the other day, uh, one of our producers contacted me about um, recommending somebody, and they were setting up to do a thing kind of like what you did, Alex, with uh, with Zoom, where you had to, um, you were the virtual person on a live stage. And I told them, I said, listen, the number one problem you're going to have is the audio. And, yeah. and I think that, you know, there's, as it turns out, there's very few great audio engineers left. Uh, really, it's hard. It's hard. I don't even know left. I don't know if they ever existed. I mean, no, they, it's just, they, they did. They did. But maybe even before your time, at least in the Bay Area. But th there were some really spectacular audio engineers. Right. And broadcast audio engineers different than a guy who mixes like a, you know, like a DJ rave nerd. But, um, uh, it's difficult. There's, yeah. it, it's a, it, it is a dying art. And I've been noticing this for like 15 years. Well, I, I think that, and again, I think that they, they bring a lot. I mean, you always want people with that kind of experience if you can find them. So, and then just adding the new things. I always, you know, I'm always like, we're just adding 30% to what you know. We're not retraining you. You already know a lot of how this all works. We just have to add the part that makes you you know, modern, <laughs> modernize that process, that, 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 that thing. And, and then they bring an enormous amount of, uh, of knowledge and experience and, and calmness because they've just seen it all before. Um, next question. From Christian Turry in London, UK. I've got a Focus Right Scarlet Solo with an Audio Technica AT2035 cardioid condenser microphone. Is it okay to leave the 48 volt phantom power always on or should I turn it off when not in use? Good, Courtney. Uh, well, you're going to need it for that microphone, so leave it on. Otherwise, you'll be very silent. Um, if you're not going to be using that cardioid condenser, if you're going to be using a, uh, a dynamic microphone into that input, then turn it off because sending DC to a dynamic microphone, you know, it's probably okay with a, with a, a phantom power, but 48 volts going across a, uh, you know, if, if one, one uh, leg drops out or you plug in an unbalanced cable to it, it could cause problems, so turn it off if you're not plugging in a condenser microphone. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, if you look over my shoulder here, that's a Neumann U87. It's an expensive microphone, and it's been powered for the most part since 1978. <laughs> that's good. Uh, next question. Next question coming in from Wilton Vargas in Guayanabo, Puerto Rico. What is the correct way to set up lavalier mics? In this case, a Sennheiser MKE2 Gold capsule to an SK500 G4 body pack linked to an EW500 G4 so that it can correctly handle extreme dynamics, normal to excited talking and shouting. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, I actually did a tutorial on the EW100 with the just regular ME2, and it's 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 all about setting up that great gain structure. So it just depends on where the mic is positioned, because some people will position them too low, and now the center here in more of the room, and you'll need to bring the the levels up so that you want it closer, more mid sternum, and then you can you can. Uh, Check the levels on the actual screen. So I'll put a link to the tutorial where I walk through this. This tutorial got over 100,000 views, and it shows you exactly the next step would be how to set up the receiver levels for the AF out. So then that receiver, actually the 500 going into, so the 100 series, if anybody's using that, it doesn't have actually enough oomph to get line level out. The the 500 series does. So you can set the that to be, I believe it's negative, it might be plus 
12 or zero. I, anyways, refer back to that tutorial. It's been a while since I've set it up, but it, I'll put the link and it walks you all the way through it. I, I actually took the information from a Sennheiser engineer and I took his his geek speak from the manual, so to speak, and, and, and distilled it down in layman's terms. So it's a really good tutorial that walks you through it. Next question. Chris Widener from Lafayette, Indiana. Many of us have been working on testing Zoom rooms for the NDI update. Would it be possible to get some of the graphic elements of Office Hours 2.0 to test with? You're more than welcome to use them. Um, the Just talk to JJ, I think. Probably reach out to JJ and he'll be able to point you towards them, but I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, next question. Dennis Champion Walker from Mansfield, UK. Will a recording be made available of last night's concert? Potentially, yeah. I mean, we can't put it on YouTube because it's the Eagles. <laughs> the Eagles are very aggressive. So so that we may put it somewhere where people can see a little bit of the, I mean, it's not the Eagles, like in case you're wondering. Everyone just was like, holy smokes, I missed the behind the scenes of the Eagles. I don't know them that well. Um, the uh, This is the Illegals. <laughs> so they're a cover band that does the Eagles. And so um, we didn't do a real concert the way we have in the past with them where we uh, you know, we, we kind of just did pieces of things that we needed for testing. And so it's not quite as useful as the other ones were, but there, it's useful for us, for what we were doing, not as useful for, um, for the general um, concert, but we'll, we'll work on getting something up for you. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I was watching last night and it was, it was brilliant. Um, were you recording ISOs and uh, a switched feed? <laughs> Yeah, primarily we're doing the ISO. So that wasn't, we weren't really trying to do a switched feed for that. We weren't trying to be entertaining as much as I was doing a little bit of it. But but for the most part, what I was trying to do is make sure that the two operated cameras out of the six were doing what they need to do. You know, one of the funny things is unless you're sitting in a switcher, it's it's hard to know what you need. So you have to kind of kind of cut a show at least to get the records. Um, you can't ever just do ISO records, you know, like you have to have somebody there trying to cut a show. So I was kind of trying to cut a show and, and then that's when you go, oh, I need a close up of this or, oh, I got two of the same thing or, oh, I've got this. And so I'm, you know, so those are the things that you're kind of, you have to see those to to get those ISOs. And um, yeah, so, and one of the things that we are going to uh, make available for f some folks, if you're interested and you can, don't reach out to me yet, but I'll just keep your eye out for it, is with some stuff like the illegals, we'll probably put up, um, a segment of the of the ISOs that if you want to try to edit that together, you can. Like you can just go ahead and try to. Here's here's all the ISOs. Here's the music. Then you can cut it together for your. They they're fine with that. We talked to them about that. And so, um, even some of the stuff with uh, Brian Vanderark, he was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so so we'll we'll, uh, uh, we'll we'll see how that we'll play with that a little bit more in the future. We we want to do a lot more of that type of thing. One other thing, no, we'll talk about it later. Next question. Uh, Chris Widener's in from Lafayette, Indiana. Has anyone used portable folding antenna towers? I'm using extendable guided poles and a folding antenna tower at home, but want for a trailer without breaking the bank. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I don't know about the breaking the bank problem, but um, Aluma makes these nice uh, extendable towers that are aluminum and telescopic and don't require uh, any guy wires, and they make them in a variety of sizes. You can see one there that is used uh, on a little trailer, so it just flips over and you crank it up where it has electric uh, up and down. They make them in a variety of heights from uh, anywhere from 106 feet to 39 feet, and they're good for up to 70 mile an hour winds, and they don't require guy wires, so it looks like a, a good solution. I do not know how much they cost, though, so you're on your own there. Next question. Next question coming in from Joe Phillips in Murphy, North Carolina. How reliable and easy to troubleshoot are the American DJ DB displays? And they have a link there for them. Yeah, they, they, they look cool. Uh, I have no idea of uh, how accurate they are. You know, they, the, um, there's no reason for them not to be, but it does look like, um, I mean, typically these are the kind of things that we would tend to um, use a, a computer for you know, so that we could really, really manage what that looked like, but, but they look like cool pieces of hardware. Go ahead, John. There's one sitting right back here in my Dante. I oh, had to reconfigure go. it for using the mix pre rather than my old mixer. And so these are not piece, good pieces of gear. I needed one new filler <laughs> and for $99, <laughs> you got giant LEDs bouncing on the front usually, but, but not useful outside of that. Yeah, no. Okay, they're not, and they're not accurate. Got it. Okay, there you go. Next question. Next question from James Fosling in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Has anyone used the free Vimeo screen recorder? Any thoughts or what do you use for screen recording videos? Guy. 
I haven't used theirs in particular, but I've used other ones like it. And you got to be careful of the codec that it's recording into because then when you go drop it in into your editing software, it can be uh, very laggy. You want to record in a format that's native. So uh, even like we will use the, the Atomus uh, Ninja and that way it's coming in as ProRes. We're cutting and recording in ProRes through and through. And the files get big, but the edit goes really smoothly. The other option, if you are going to go with the lower bit rate and want everything uh, nice and neat, especially if you're not using video, then uh, Telestream has a screen flow. That's what I would use. Yeah, I mean, the ones that we see trainers use the most are ScreenFlow and Camtasia are the kind of the ones that we see from a screen capture perspective. Um, you know, from they have a lot of creature comforts like uh, they, they, they can set cap capture your keystrokes and capture your, uh, your, your cursor, you know, uh, separately. And there's a lot of things that they can stack up that make it really easy to build training. For folks that are just really doing screen captures of things, almost everybody I know is using some kind of external recorder, like an Atomos for 1080p. I capture a lot of stuff on still a Pix 240, um, but uh, but you can get, have a lot of different things that you send out to a recorder because it will record in ProRes and as you know, it just comes in easy and it's a lot less work for your computer. Your computer just sees it as another monitor as opposed to having to process the screen. Go ahead, uh, Chris. Um, yeah, I was just looking at the Vimeo page. It's definitely designed for somebody doing a presentation who wants to, um, you know, capture themselves. I think they even gr grab your um, your webcam, which is something that I think Camtasia does. I know the ScreenFlow does. The reason why uh, I would highly, highly recommend you use uh, ScreenFlow, ScreenFlow doesn't actually record a video of your screen. Uh, it's Mac only, by the way. Uh, what it does is it records the OpenGL information, I think it's what it's called, that draws your screen. And what that means is if you're trying to teach somebody how to do something uh, that's on the screen, uh, you can zoom way in on it and it looks fantastic because it's just redrawing it and scaling it up. It's like it's like the difference between a, a JPEG and an a a EPS file. You can zoom in better on it. Um, but if you're just given a presentation, here's my slides, here's my thing, uh, probably any one of these would do just fine. And remember that a lot of these will record, whether it's, it's PowerPoint or Keynote, they'll record, you can re, you can set them to record the presentation. So if you're doing a presentation, you can actually have, like, for instance, I do these all the time. Someone says, oh, can you do a slide deck? And the problem is I don't build slide decks with lots of text. So mine are lots of images. And I, but I still want to tell you what I want to tell you. I just don't want to type it. <laughs> so I turn the slide deck on and I go through it as if I was, as if you were there. Then I hit stop and I hit export video and I get a quick time file and I send it to you. Like this is the, this is the presentation. Um, and I don't have to, you know, write it out. And I believe that will also work if, you know, Keynote now lets you add live video. So you can have your live video and have you appear in the slide or move over to where you want. It'll capture all of that. And then, then you can save it out. So that's one way to look at that as well. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, yeah, if you need to record the, your screen and your video camera, then the other you know screen capture stuff works. But remember, you're going to be working your computer extra hard to be shuffling that st stuff off, compressing it, and saving it to disk, and running your demo or whatever software you're going to be demonstrating at the same time. So you could run into problems there. That's why I almost always use something like this... Uh, uh, outboard recorder. This is a HDML cloner box turbo. It just takes HDMI in, records uh, output onto a, a USB thumb drive. It can be USB 2 output. It records an H.264 1080p uh, file, which you can load in and play on anything uh, because it's, you know, standard uh, 10 megabit H, you know, H.264. For a 1080p output, it works just fine. If you can have higher resolution output slides, then you want to do get into screen capture. Uh, next question. Eduardo Augustine in Panama. Going back to old school times, any suggestion on how to get a VHS movie to digital? Uh, go ahead, Sky. Oh, I just did a simple search. And surprisingly, there are s several places here in the Seattle area that will do it for you manually. Uh, in almost in person. So I was going to suggest that you, you know, look around your local area of people that would do it, but understand it's not editorial. They're physically just converting your file 
or you're you're turning your your analog VHS tape into a digital file. So you're going to get blue at the beginning and you're going to get, they may not even watch it and they'll give you an hour's worth of, of some kind of, you know, SD media and that you'll have to go in and edit afterwards. So uh, it's not editorial that, that you're going to get, but you will get off the, the tape onto a digital file that you can then play inside your, your nonlinear editor. I right, go ahead, Don Mitchell. If you got a stack of projects that you need to transfer, then they, there's a bunch of devices you can see on uh, Amazon that'll take a VHS and turn it into a, a file of some kind. Same thing with uh, records, and same thing with cassettes. It's kind of handy, but I like Sky's solution. Just hand it off to somebody else and let it be their problem. <laughs> Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, if you still got a VHS player that works, uh, see previous question as far as the cloner, the DVD cloner. Here's another one that's called uh, Digit Now. And uh, this has inputs for standard def uh, input, component input. If you've got a VHS recorder that outputs, uh, you know, component video, you can use that or a composite I input. So this will digitize analog video coming off a of VHS recorder and it records it directly like the previous thing onto a USB drive as H.264 and 1080p or 720p. Next question. And it's from Douglas Carmichael. In 2006, 2D3 marketed a scaled down version of Buju Bullet for $399, which included a free three month PXC membership. Could you see the DVE store, for example, marketing packages of equipment for specific tasks along with OH curated training resources? I go with Guy. Yeah, Douglas going into the Wayback Machine. That's way back. I, know, I, was, like, I was like, where <laughs> digging, did that digging, come from? I have forgot I even did that. Yeah, I mean, I could see pairing up if there was a physical good. We did it with the cookbooks um, for Hasbook. So we have a 19,000 square foot warehouse up in Everett, Washington. If there was something in particular that needed to be shipped for the group, as long as it made sense, I don't want to lose money. Hasbook's thing has been a losing battle <laughs> because it, they haven't been moving. So I've been storing them for months. So there, it's got to be something that moves. Yeah, I think digital products are a little easier to work with in a global environment. I think that's the big thing. I think it's great. By the way, I have the um, Dunyanti's uh, cookbook. It's a great cookbook. I use it. Um, and so I would highly recommend it. Um, but uh, I think digital is a little easier to work with there. I, I do think that there is... Um, uh, I think there's an opportunity for us to build some kits that we think... You know, like I think there's somewhere there could be office hours style kits, you know, that are like we've decided that this is a really great basic, you know personal presence kit that's like the office hour you know stamp of approval uh it was it was really funny when i um this is why one of the reasons office hours got built was because companies like like bnh came to me and said you know can you give us hangout kits you know this is back in 2012 and uh i didn't you know i wasn't willing to tell anyone how i did it <laughs> like i was like no i'm not you know like whatever money i'm gonna make well, you know matt building a kit i'm not gonna make i make more doing it you know then it, you know and so i was very and i learned that you you know you need to build a bigger market so i think that us finding ways that we can build that recommendation for people you know on the website and and provide the knowledge so that everyone learns it and then give them somewhere they can just click and go and buy it i think makes a lot of sense so we'll, so we'll keep playing with that idea go ahead chris I find it very interesting to to look at the difference between um, what I'll say is just us, a bunch of you know technical nerds, and the type of people that really need what we do. Um, you know, C suite people, uh, you know, subject matter experts in various industries. Um, they're not inclined to like deal with all of this because that's not what they do. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to partner. I, I know that we're, there are people in, in our midst, like I take, take, for example, like Ray Franklin, who is a speaking coach. That's what he does. And he's, you know, he's in office hours. We really need to figure out with them, how do we, how do we approach those people that the, the people that are not our um, technical peers those are the people that we want to reach out to. And Guy, I've been telling you for months and months, maybe a year now, that you need to have, you know, premium setups, beginner setups, intermediate setups, just like go to the page, buy these 10 things and go. And it doesn't have to be a one click, but it's like, these the are the five things, things you need. The way it's currently, are... yeah, what's go ahead, that? Go ahead, go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, the way it's currently set up is like, here's some great cameras. Uh, no, no, don't give me choices. 
Say, I got 10 grand to spend. This is what I should buy. I got two grand to spend. This is what I should buy. And just like, and because, and I'll say this, um, when I bought my 6K from Guy, I was like, Guy, I don't know how to mount this on the pole. He goes, you need this and this and this. And I didn't even flinch. I, w- I mean, I looked at it, I was like, oh, really? It's 220 bucks or whatever it was. And I was like, eh, Guy said it was right. That's what I should buy. And so you have a, 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 an impeccable uh, um uh, image, or I don't know, that's not the right word I'm trying to, try, uh, reputation is the word I was looking for. Um, and people trust you. And so um, I think coming from you, this is just, I'm just coaching Guy on his business here. Um, I, I think coming from you, it would be very well received. And um, I, I have nothing else to say, sorry. And out. Yeah, no, I, I think that, I think that the, um, uh, I, I think that you're right that people need to have something that just they can just turn turnkey and just we'll send it out to you with with instructions on how to build it with instructions on how to do it with instructions on like this is just how you're successful you know in that in that model yeah so uh, last uh, last question for the, for the first the hour and a half I finally question. decided by the way I sent back a bunch of questions to everybody uh, I you can put them in tomorrow um, the uh, they we we had a bunch of questions I, I finally decided that ninety minutes was. The, the most we can put into this before we go into the into the second hour. Uh, go ahead, Tony. No, it's me <laughs> asking the question that. for t- Tony. Uh, Tony. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah. My tally stopped working. Is it just me, Tony? Is it? Apologies, guys. I, I I don't know if it's just me or not, but I want to tell you that I am spoiled. I am enjoying my green tea with lemon juice, and then I'm seeing myself on camera. I'm like. Oh, and I realized that the, the tally lighters had stopped working. Okay. So, um, guys, is it is it just me? Do I need to refresh? What what's what's going on? Yeah. Does anyone know which I I uh, I have to Mickey's, admit? I'm, yeah. Mickey says uh, you currently have two accounts. Make sure you're using the right pin. Ah, there you go. Yeah, that, that's probably okay. the issue there. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay. We're now jumping into our second hour, only 30 minutes late. I, I went over it and I, I, again, I apologize for sending quick questions back to everybody. I, I was like, well, we'll go a little over. And then I looked up and I was like, oh my gosh, we're 90 minutes out. So, so I do need a little bit of time to, to show you what I'm talking about here, what I promised. And because I've, I've talked about doing this for like a year and a half. And so I, I felt like I should actually do it today. So, um, so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about, we've talked about it informally. I think I've shown it after hours and I may have shown it randomly somewhere, but I wanted to have one place that people could see it so you could just understand it. So what I'm going to do is show you how to build countdown clocks inside of countdown clocks and 3D countdown clocks inside of motion. It's a little quirky, um, I, I will admit, uh, but it's also, uh, it's pretty cool when you, when you actually do it. And the reason that, that, uh, I wanted to show it is that I actually think that this feature, just this feature, just doing this in motion is maybe it's worth paying 50 bucks. Like if, if, if you just had this one feature of uh, building a 3D countdown clock and you see the 3D countdown clocks that have changed a couple of times at the beginning of a, our show, that takes me like five minutes to set, build a new one. Um, and so it's, you know, I, um, these are, it's relatively easy to do and and literally for 50 bucks, it's not that you can't do it in After Effects or you can't do it in something else, but After Effects is 50 bucks a month and Motion is 50 bucks once, like once, like all the updates that show up in Motion, you paid it once. <laughs> you know, so, so, so I'm not saying that you can definitely use other programs, so don't feel like this is the only way to do it. In fact, I used to do them in After Effects. Um, I did find that it was easier to do them in Motion than After Effects. And again, it's 50 bucks once. And now you can just make countdown clocks. So even if you don't learn how to do anything else in motion, this is a pretty useful one. So let me cut to uh, to motion here. So we'll, um, let's see here. So here we get that. And I got to turn something on so I can see it. Ah, there we go. All right. So um, so here we are in motion. And uh, I'm going to show you, this is, you know, just the basic, basic layout here. Um, and I'm going to go from the, it's going to be a little slow because I'm going to go right from, I, I, I actually don't want to, do a Julia Child's version of it. I want to kind of show you each piece of it. Um, and I didn't rehearse it 20 times, so I, you'll, you'll see some dead ends probably. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go up here and, and there's generators. And in these generators, um, I go here, oops, no, text generator. And this is a little frustrating, but there is no time clock. Uh, the best you can do is time code. So I'll put that time code and you'll see this little time code here. Um, now I'm going to, now I tend to not grab onto things in motion. Um, I have this kind of this thing about precision. So I will go in here, um, and I will go to my properties and, 
oh, I'm sorry, I'll go to text generator and I will go to format and then I will turn this up. I like to scale things up and move things around more specifically. So, um, and, and I don't, you don't have to do that. It's just a, it's a weird thing that I do. So anyway, so, um, so anyway, so we have the, the appearance here um, that's, that's there, there. And um, what we're gonna, now I might go back to properties here. And again, now I can move this around. So I'm gonna move it. It is important that you get it kind of where you want it first. Um, to make this actually work. So I'll get it there. Now, this is the part that I'd like to thank Mark Spencer because I was I was doing these countdown clocks and I was then reversing the video later to get it to count down. And Mark pointed out that you can just do, you can turn off current keyframe and now you can, um, I can keyframe the value. <laughs> so I was like, oh yeah, yeah I could do that too. Um, now here, this countdown clock, right now I have a duration of 12 minutes. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make that 10 minutes um, and 15 frames. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, I'm also going to, so, so I have that set up. So that this is now my project length um, that I have here. Um, so you can see this, this is out here. So you can see that I got 10 and 15. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my, um, my time code. And I am going to go into text generator and I'm going to set this to uh, 15 or 10, I'm sorry, not, not, not 15, 10. Um, yeah, there we go. So now there's, there, so anyway, so, so I'll type that in. So now it's 10. Now you probably wondered why I had 15 at the end instead of 10. It's because I want 15 frames of leader. So I, I wanted to get to zero and I want it to hang. So you might make it a minute of hang, 30 seconds of hang, but I'm, I'm giving it 15 frames of hang. So I'm gonna set this and I'm gonna set this time code to, I'm gonna keyframe it so that it's set at, at that. And then I'm gonna go to the end here, all the way to the end and I'm gonna go back 15. So now I'm at, I'm at 10 minutes straight, you can see the time code here. And I'm going to go ahead and I am going to drop this to zero. Sorry. I don't know why it wants to do that. Anyway, so we'll leave it there for now. I'm trying to figure out why it wants to go to four. Are you drop frame? Oh, yeah, hold on. No, hold on. My... Of course I do a presentation and my mouse stops working. There we go. Um, there's something about the Kensington mouse or Kensington thing that, that just stops working every once in a while. And that should be, and then we have format here. Sorry, I am like, of course we do a presentation and literally it has, Yes, this is the Steve Jobs demo fail. I know, I know. This is like the craziest fail. There's something must be open here somewhere because it's... Courtney, I know you have one of those sound effects queued up. Is it sad, sad trombone? Is it <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. There we go. Will everyone in the audience please turn off your phones? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so we'll set this to 20. Uh, there we go. All right, so... Um, so we have this set, set there. I have no idea what just happened there. All right. So, uh, now what we should do is, so now you can see it scrolling backwards like this. So there, there we have our little, um, our countdown clock starting up here and it started, it is changed. I don't know why it's. There we go. And that should be, that'll be, uh. So now it'll count down. It's always something. All right. So, so now we have uh, this countdown clock here, and it's it's going now. The problem is we don't need these zeros, and we don't need this here. Um, but we have before we get into that, before we start figuring out how to get rid of that, um, we're going to go back here, and the first we have to set it to mono space. Um, the first thing you want to do is this will start to this can move around. Um, so the first thing we want to do is I usually have it. It's set to center. And I will set it to, um, I will set it to justify, I'm sorry, yeah, justify here. Um, and then I'll also set it to mono space, which will make it go really far apart. And I'll drag it back over here. Now that's going to look crazy. Um, but what I'll do is I'm going to do my tracking and I'm going to bring my, bring it back together. 
and this will guarantee that it won't um, move around while it's while it's uh, counting down. So now it's always going to be, you'll see it doing this kind of weird bouncing thing, but that's just this end product here. So you don't have to worry about that. So now we have it, um, we have it centered here and uh, in a mono space at the distance that we want. And now what I'm going to do is turn it into a 3D clock. So now it's, it is a, you know, there's my clock. And here's the thing. There's a lot of things that do this automatically. Um, so there's a lot of like countdown clocks you can buy and everything else. And this is just over black. But remember that now I can design, you know, any of these. Um, let's see if I can show you some. I can design any any kind of image that I want instead of it being, um, you know, in, instead of just, just being a countdown clock, um, you know, I can build a countdown. I can make it look, by doing it in this kind of design, I can make it look any way I want. And so even if you're only doing 2D, this is valuable because you can now just design your countdown clocks. Now, what we did show here is that, you know, we have the seconds in this over here. So what I do is I simply go up to the group and I'm going to build a mask and I am going to cut the parts out that I don't need like that. So now there's my countdown clock. Um, so now you can see the countdown clock going down. So now I have that countdown clock that's there. So th there's my countdown clock and I can be any font that I want. I can composite it over top of images. I can integrate it into those images. You know, I can put whatever I want there. Now, in this case, I want to make it 3D. So I'm simply going to go to my appearance and I'm going to say I want 3D text. And uh, it won't look that much different when, when you first hit it because it's just all white. Um, but I can go in here and say, instead of single, I want multiple. And... Um, now it's going to do something that I didn't expect. Let's see here. There we go. I am not sure. I, this, it's got to be something with the way I'm stre streaming something or something else that's going on on my computer. Um, so now I have uh, now I have a front. I have a front edge side. So if I make this front edge, let's say metal, and we'll go into here and go to Chrome. You can see that it's kind of turned to chrome here. Now that, that chrome, I can do a lot of different things here. So I can say this depth, I can make it deeper. So I, there's a thicker countdown clock. So those are there. And you'll notice that it really is 3D. It's not just extruding because you see the inside of this side on one side and this side on the other. So it's really a 3D representation of that of that there. Um, and now I can say, well, I want the weight. I can make the weight of the of the text a little bit you know, higher, you know, bigger or smaller. The front edge is around, but I could, I have a lot of options. I can make the front edge bigger. And for those of us who've done a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, 3D, this is not, <laughs> this used to not be so easy. So I think that's part of why a lot of us go, oh, this is really great. And um, so anyway, so, so this is, you know, so now I have a 3D countdown clock here. I can adjust each one of these, the sides, for instance, I can make this a different metal. Um, that's there. So I'll give it a little. So now it's, oh, it's a little dark. Um, and it looks a little dark, I think, coming to you through here. I think it's just the, the gamma going out. So, um, and I apologize for that. I'm, I'm not going to fix that right now. Um, but you can play with, you know, any of these side things. Now, the other thing that you have here is um, uh, as you, as you kind of work through this, I don't know why it's so dark, actually. Let's see if I can. Um, I'm sorry, I am going to take a little bit of a break here for just a second to see if I can um, fix that. And I'm noticing that it's super dark on your side. Um, this is probably something I should have. I don't know why the gamma is so. Let's see here. It's a little better, right? But not much. Little I bit. Have, I have it's still so super many. dark though. Yeah, a little better there. That's better. Um, that was much nope. worse, right? Nope. So we're all learning. Bad. Yeah. I Are should've. you changing the uh, display settings? Yeah, I'm trying to change the display setting to something that'll make sense, and I am not succeeding. I have so many gammas in here that, that it's kind of <laughs> hard to tell which one is which. So we're gonna leave it at that one there. It's a little bit brighter than it was before. Yep. Um, I know. I think trying to fix that right now will take more time than we have because I cut so much time off. So anyway, so um, 
so anyway, so you have the 3D here. Now there's other things in here that you can, you have a lot of different, you know, it's not just that you have control over the Chrome, for instance, um, you know, or the front or whatever, but you can go in here and with any of these, you select the Chrome here. Um, and you, you have the metal here, but you have what type of metal, you know, I could, I could change it here as well. So I can change these settings here. Um, I have, uh, you know, there's, so there's a lot, you know, thickness of, you know, the base and the highlight, uh, glow drop shadows. And you, so you have a lot of tools um, that are in here. So here's the, you know, a lot of different, and each one of these has their own set of tools. So this is like multiple finishes all for this glitter paint that's on the side that you can't really see at the moment. Um, but you also can go up here um, and uh, the environment is not you know, like, so if I open up the environment, the environment has a lot, this is a field, but I have lots of different environments that I could use. So I could throw this on and it's going to be a completely different look, you know, than what I have here. Um, and so here's like a light box, you know? Um, so there's, there's lots of different looks that you can apply to this, um, this scene. Um, and you can also rotate these, you know, you can move where, you know, what that, how that reflection map is being used across that, um, that 3D space. So, so there's, you know, it's a, it's an amazing amount of control over the 3D text. It's not just like, oh, I want to extrude it out. You can do a lot of things here that can really, um, you know, kind of build it out. And then you hit render <laughs> you know, and, and that's it. And so when, when you're not trying to share it, which is of course the, the Murphy's law of doing this, um, this takes me like five minutes to get the base of what I want. And then I might play with it for another 10 or 15 minutes and I hit render. Now there is a couple things that I do that are probably make it look a little bit nicer on some of these curves, you'll see some aliasing. Um, and so what I have a tendency to do is render these out at 4k or 8k. Um, you know, you can do it and you can work in 8k and what that'll do is it'll create a much larger image than I run it through a compressor to, um, and I use an anti-aliasing to bring, go from 8k to 1080p or 8k to 4k. I'm basically oversampling it and I get rid of some of the small aliasing that occurs. Um, you know, that's inherent to a real time renderer because essentially, you know, uh, motion is a, is a real time render. You'll notice that I did all this 3d and I can sit there and preview it and I can even, you know, while it's still, this is the thing with motion that you get used to is it's still, um, running and while it's running, I can sit here and go, well, I'd, I'd rather have this, you know, and it, it, you know, just keeps going, you know, so you're, you know, you can make these adjustments, you know, in motion while it's running. Um, and then you can put backgrounds behind it. You can do a lot of it. We can talk about lots of other things that we can do in motion, but, um, but it's a really, again, I feel like this feature by itself is worth 50 bucks, you know, if you're building live events, because you'll stop, you know, whether you're doing 2D or 3D, you'll stop doing, you'll stop using turnkey countdown clocks when you can build your own in five, five or 10 minutes. Um, that really look like the, you know, the client, you know, what the, what the, what the, what the event is, it, they fit in. Um, and the, the 3D is just a flex and I felt like it was worth uh, showing. Um, but, but a lot of times, even if we're doing 2D ones, it makes it, it's worth, um, it, it's, just, it's just so like, a, if you're going to do a countdown clock, it's really, really worth making it great. Like you should be looking at everything that you do is, is if you have a, we'll be right back slide call to action slide, pre-show slide, all of those, you want them to be great. Everything should be great. You know, there's no reason, unless you're doing like 10 of these a, a, a day, but most of us aren't doing that. And, you know, just, just, and this is just one of the m minor ways of kind of making that work. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mitch. You know, what's interesting in watching you do that in motion. I'm not a motion guy. I'm an After Effects guy. I would do it exactly the same way in After Effects. I would create a time code. I would tell it to reverse the time code. I would mask out uh, the the frames in seconds or up to seconds. And almost exactly the same thing, I'd apply a plug in to get the 3D text if I wanted it. So it's not just motion, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's also in After Effects uh, that it works like that. And I agree 100% with you that why buy a pre-made something from somebody else that other people are using when you have complete and total control over it in a, uh, on a compositing program like motion or after effects. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and there's hey. some of them that are relatively cost effective. It's not like they're, they are, um, you know, super expensive. It's just that they, um, I feel like you're, you know, they just don't look, they don't look like a real, you know, thing. 
you know, and I think that that's the, you know, they, they don't look like it's part of the image. You want everything in your, whether it's a lower third or whether it's a, you know, those types of things, you want them all to be um, something that is, uh, you know, that, that makes you feel like you're, the show starts when, as soon as you start streaming, you know, and so, so that's the kind of, um, you know, thing that you want to, you know, always kind of keep in mind, you know, through the whole thing is like, how do I, um, you know, how do I, you know, make it feel like you're watching, you know, and, and I'll show you just, and, and I've shown some of these before, because we've talked about countdown clocks before. Um, but uh, let me see if I can, um, if I, uh, sorry, I have a different view right now. But if I cut to this, and, and you look at like, each one of these, if you look at like a countdown clock, this feels like it's part of the show, right? It's not, you know, each one of these is different. You know, this, you know, the, these countdown clocks, you know, are, you know, integrated, you know, into, you know, the overall look of the, um, you know, of the, of the, of the scene, you know, and so, and it all depends on, you know, what you're, you know, what you're getting, you know, on these. But the main thing is, is that I just feel like you, um, you know, you, you want to be thinking about how do I, you know, like this one is a good example of, you know, you see this, I've got this, you know, the countdown clock is matching the 24, you know, um, you know, scene. And so this is the thing that is, but, but, you know, each one of these is, it's worth, you know, in my opinion, um, doing kind of the extra, you know, the extra work that's required where you, you know, here's one that each one of these is completely different. You can't do that with a, um, you know, with a turnkey, uh, you know, system, you know, if you look at, you know, each one of these has, you know, they look the way that they look because we, you know, we, because that's the, that's the whole feel of the show. And so, you know, that's the thing that you want to kind of, you know, kind of keep in mind. And the 3D is just one way to flex when it makes sense. And it's super easy to do as is doing, you know, all those other pieces of it. So, so anyway, that'd be my The real trick would be to have it talk to an XML file and consume the file in order so you can set the time I think New Blue might do that. There's lots of things to do it. It's just that you can do this one for 50 bucks. <laughs> like, you know, that, that, that's the only thing I want to say. Uh, next question. It's coming up from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. Can you do essentially the same thing in Keynote? I don't know how to do a countdown clock in Keynote. I wish, it, I, wish I did. That would be amazing. Like a countdown clock in Keynote would be really cool. Um, I don't know of a countdown clock in Keynote, but Wow on so many levels, because you could totally, if they just added a countdown clock drop in for Keynote, you could build the countdown clocks in Keynote. So, um, but of course, couldn't do it in 3D yet. Um, next question. From Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia. I want to do countdown clocks for House of Worship. Any suggestions for someone who never used motion, but willing to try? Uh, do that, watch the video, you know, get motion, watch the video I just did, try it. And then ping us on, you know, we'll set up a time in after hours and we'll, if you're having trouble getting it to work, uh, we'll, we'll hash through it. Yeah, absolutely. But hopefully that inspires you to, to, to play with it and we're inspire some other folks to play with it. And um, yeah, go ahead, Sky. We often use a resource that also has a quiz during the countdown. So we're finding that people actually attend earlier because they want to be a part of the quiz. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you can do. Um, on those countdown clocks, you can put, we put um, some of the countdown clocks, we put a QR code that takes you to Makana. <laughs> so like, here's a QR code and you, you see it and you, you jump off to Makana and you can ask questions while you're doing it. So, you know, those are the kind of things that you can do. Um, next question. From Dory Miles in Lake Zurich, Illinois, what platform does Motion run on? Uh, runs on the Mac. Yeah, it's made by Apple and runs, it runs on the Mac. Um, next question. Uh, it's from Peter Belbin in Houston, Texas. Can the clock be rendered in real time so that it can be given a target date time and count down to that? No. <laughs> I mean, there are other, there's bigger broadcast systems that will, that will do that for you. And I do think it would be a great app, but uh, it hasn't been written yet in an affordable sort of way. But I don't know of any other ones that do, do it in real time that, that are, you know, less than tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, next question. Hello, Sky Gleason from Seattle, Washington. How much RAM do you have, or is the M1 the new processor that Motion is using? So what I just showed it to you on, maybe it was a little clunky, is I have a bunch of windows open. I'm using a 2017 iMac. That's what I use here. And I have a bunch, I have this Zoom and a bunch of other windows, and then I had Motion running on it. So that it would, it would have, 
I meant to run it on an M1 Mac with 16 gigs of RAM or whatever. And I just might, for some reason, my HDMI wasn't showing up this morning. I didn't have time to fix it because I was up late last night uh, with that concert. So I, um, uh, so it, it's a overloaded, you know, um, 2017, I got like eight apps open. I've got windows all over the place. And so that's what it does when it. How much it RAM, how much RAM on that iMac? 32 gigs. Yeah. So, but, but it was, but. It was a really nice one when I bought it six years ago or five years ago, but um, so yeah, so it's, but it's an, it's an old computer. It's not like I'm running on anything new. Um, next question. Jason Pankson, Nashville, Tennessee. How would you add a still graphic or video background to your countdown? Uh, I, I might've just closed motion while I was talking, but um, I might, might've closed that window. Hold on, let me see if I can pull that up again. But it is, um, it's super easy. You just put it in a layer below it. And for some reason I thought that I, Oh, hold on. I may still have it there. Hold on. Let's see. So, got that. Yeah. So all you have to do is, I mean, literally, let's see if I can find an image that is acceptable to, to drag in. Let's just drag this in here. So I just drag it right in. Um, the one thing about motion is it will put it where your cursor is. And so I have a tendency to pull back to the beginning so I don't have to deal with it later. So I pull back to the beginning or that's, it's a setting, but I, anyway, so then you drag it right into here. It'll drop in centered and I can hold down the option key and Oops, no, no, don't hold up. It's different. Every every app has this different. So. So there's the, I've made it in the background here. Now it's in a group above it. I can just take this group and move it above that. And now it's over top. So um, did that. There we go. So now, now the, this group is on top of that group, but that's it. That's, that's how you put it over top of an image. So it's pretty, pretty straightforward as far as that goes. Go ahead, John. I like the new countdown clock better than the old one. If you change the faces of the numbers to red instead of black, I think it, it would be, have better contrast. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I have one that's already rendered with the white. I just keep forgetting to upload it for JJ. <laughs> so, so it's already sitting here uh, with a, with a brighter for, uh, foreground there, but I, you know, I can play with it. And if, if someone wants to come up with uh, really the next version of this, I'm going to show you how to do it in, in cinema. I'm working on using um, nodes in cinema to, to build it. So the idea is there's a function in cinema that will do it. And all you have to do is change the models. So I want to basically build it so that it has a countdown clock in it and it jumps to each you know it knows what one two three you know one through zero is you know one through nine zero is and it just changes them you know as it goes and but it's taking you a little longer um to put that together go ahead courtney can you apply little animations to the change between the numbers so like the numbers slide down like it's a rotating cylinder clock or Anything like that? Or I probably could if I put more work into it. Right now, it's just using the, the count. It's using time code. So it's just changing from one to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the maybe we'll get Alex Golner to come on and do a countdown clock version two. Alex does it completely different than I do. So Alex Goldner's is, is both, it's cooler, but I can never remember how to do it. <laughs> so I have to look at it. He animates them all so that they're animated. He animates each one of those so that they, and then his, you know, he, they've, he's got a little animation for each one on, on how they transition. And then he cuts and pastes them to loop and, and everything else. So he builds a loop. He, his is much more technically interesting than mine. Mine's the how to do it really quickly. And if you don't, you don't have to have a lot of experience in motion to do it. Um, Alex's is the, 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 the true master's way of crafting a, a countdown clock. Because uh, he, he, he sent me back one and I looked at it. I was like, I just barely understand what he's doing. And it's really cool. And, um, but it's much more, his is much better than mine. So. And the, the other question I had is, uh, since you're rendering this out as a video file, is how do you back time it correctly so that it ends up right at zero at the right moment in time? Uh, especially since you may be starting it at an unknown point. Yeah, so, I mean, this is why we, we kind of wish, and again, the automatic ones kind of do it, and this is why I wish it was an app, but right now what we do is we look at the, I mean, we literally, it's when we hit the play and we're looking at the count, you know, we you you think about, literally, I need a five minute countdown and you have to start the playback. You don't have to start displaying it immediately, but you do start the playback at a very specific time, you know, and so that it counts down. And uh, it depends on whether you want to be on time. So we're on time with the atomic clock for this show, as opposed to 
in many shows I do, we're on time to the stream. So it means that the stream, or well, the stream is on time. It, it's, is your show on time for the atomic clock or is the stream on time for the atomic clock? And so if, if the, it's easier to say the show is on time, which means we start right at the atomic clock. You start the five minute countdown exactly five minutes before the show so that it counts down properly. And again, it counts down so that there's, I'm in the one that I just made 15 seconds a liter. Um, the, uh, uh, if you wanna do it for the stream, it means that you want it to be at zero, zero, zero for the person watching the stream on the far end. And then what we do is we play the countdown clock early on and you hear someone yell out, you know, offset is 22 seconds because it changes every single day. Um, and it's not perfectly accurate, but you can get plus or minus uh, like two, two seconds. And so it starts so that the person watching a stream on YouTube or Facebook or whatever, it really starts right on time. And I don't know if it really is that important, but we do it because it's a, it's a fun sport. <laughs> Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, adding backgrounds uh, to both the programs, motion or after effects or anything, is inherently part of that program anyhow. So it's just a yeah. second nature thing. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. TJ Asher, Minneapolis, Minnesota. How are you getting the colon closer to the numbers in the examples you showed compared to the demo? And he has a link there. Uh, it's just changing the tracking. You know, I think it's just it's just changing that tracking. The big problem you have is different text. You just don't want the text to run over, the, the numbers to run over each other in mono space um, to make that happen. Um, next question. Christian Turry in London, UK. What is the output of this motion countdown clock? A video file and how do you use it? Yeah, so we I output that as a video file and usually it's an Apple ProRes file. Um, if I'm using it, if I build it for HDR, of course it's in HQ or in 444 or one or the other. Um, but typically, and then it depends on what kind of system we're running into. If we're running through a software playback, I actually render these out at one frame a second because the, like a playback pro or a, or a, um, you know, many of the other software playbacks don't care what the frame rate is. They just play it back at the right time. And since something's only changing once a second, I can render it out at one frame a second. Um, and by doing that, the file's a lot smaller. <laughs> so, so that's, you know, that's, that's why I do it that way. But um, if I'm doing it out of hardware, which is what we do here, I have to render it out at the full uh, 5994 or 2997 to, to have it play out correctly. Next question. Peter Belbin in Houston. I do countdown to target date time using Casper CG and HTML JavaScript for live countdown that renders to key and fill so it can be used with a switcher. That's great. We can't wait to have you do a second hour on how you do that. We're ready. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm basically tempting you to, to come in and show us how you do it. So, so well done, Peter. Uh, just, just ping me on, on Discord. We'll schedule your second hour and you can show us how you do it. Uh, next question. Christian Tory from London, UK. Can you also show the time when the countdown will get to zero? The use case is for day-long Zoom webinars when people get a break and they need to know at what time they need to come back after the break. Yeah, you could do anything. I mean, it's a countdown clock, so you could have something counting up, something counting down. I've done ones where we have that countdown clock for whatever reason, we make them all changing for people's local time. So they're, you know, it's it's like it's coming, you know, the countdown clock is it's this the time, but here are all the local times. And, you know, you can definitely, um, you know, do those those types of things as well. All right, we only went two minutes over. But that's why, if for those of you who watched me push back questions at 8.30, that's why I was like, I think I need about a half an hour. I don't know, know if I need a whole hour, but I need a half an hour to have a discussion. So anyway, so hopefully that inspires some of you to play with it. Um, I think that there's like a 30 or 90 day thing of, if you're on a Mac of, of motion, I'm sure that um, if Mitchell wants to show how to do this in, in After Effects, he's more than welcome to. Uh, you can do it, we can build up an After, uh, an after Hours or, or something else to do that, or even a second hour on, on countdown clocks and after effects. But, but uh, again, I used to do them that way. It's just that I, I would prefer, I, I always am trying to build something you have to do every day is try to get it so I can hand it off to somebody else and I'm, and I'm not paying 50 bucks a month to. Yeah, the after effects it. would be finicky. It's, it's finicky, but very tweaky. Yeah, this one is, once you get, once you get good at it in motion, it's super fast and easy. And, and uh, especially when I'm not trying to present and do everything that I did here. Um, but uh, it's usually, again, if I need to do one, like I asked the client, like send me raw assets for the background and the font, you know, or what the font it is. And then I just put the font in, I make, so I make sure that the countdown clock is in their font. Um, and then I, I usually end up concocting the, the, the frame. Sometimes they have an art department that does that for me. I just tell them this is what I need. I get, I send them a template, like I need a box where I'm gonna put the text. You know, you gotta tell me where you want that and what the scale is and then I put it together, but it takes just minutes and it, it's just so much nicer. 
<laughs> hopefully this inspires you, whether you use motion or After Effects or Casper CG, just stop using ones that are generic. Like that's that's my that's my only my only two cents is don't use generic countdown clocks. Use ones that, you know, are nice and pretty and look like your show. All right. Um, all right, that's it. Thanks so much for our uh, producers for asking all the great questions. Lots of questions today. Really, really, really well done. And thanks to our panelists. Can't do this without you. And we also can't do it without this incredible team that's constantly learning and constantly working on this seven days a week. Um, so just amazing work. And now we're going to jump into After Hours. Someday Mitchell's going to learn how to whisper. I know it can happen. It's going to happen. I don't, I don't know. Mitchell. I need therapy. I think we need, we need to do this. We have to do it in 5-1 eventually, where we're just calling from different speakers. Mitchell. <laughs> just, just, in fact, I might have to... Look how red my face.